A while back I made a video on the book Shinumai ni Clear Shitai ni Hyok no Murige, or in English, 200 Impossible Games to Beat Before You Die. It's a compilation of 200 games for the Famicom and Super Famicom that Japanese retro gamers consider to be extremely difficult, whether it's because they're actually challenging or because they're incredibly unfair. The book is divided into two halves, 100 Famicom games and 100 Super Famicom games. Since I was documenting the Famicom's library, I only spoke about the 100 Famicom games. With that documentation project done, it was time to return to the book and check out the Super Famicom side. But here's the thing about 200 Impossible Games. It's a pretty bad book. I came across it because it was used as a reference point in a few online articles. But when you look into the book itself, it has a pretty bad reputation. There's no credited author, and the book has the feeling of a quickie hack job. Something where an unfortunate freelancer was given not nearly enough time, and they just went down a list picking out things they recognized. The lists are incredibly front-loaded. The halfway mark of the Super Famicom library occurs around roughly position 69 in this almost chronologically arranged list. That is better than the regular Famicom, where the halfway mark for the library's total releases was at position 86. You really can tell that they just started with a list of games and then worked their way down. On top of that, the book is very poorly edited. The Super Famicom section in particular gets a lot of basic things wrong. And I'm going to do my best to correct those, at least. Also, most of the games are rated on difficulty, game quality, and how unreasonable they are. But in the Super Famicom section, sometimes they're missing some of those categories. Despite those caveats, it is a convenient resource to know what has a reputation for being difficult. And a lot of the games I'm going to touch on are well known in Japan, but not so well overseas. I've got a lot of games to look at, so let's dive in. And the list kicks off with the first third party game on the Super Famicom. Okay, there's one game on the list before it. But it's a 1992 release that they gave a release date for six months before the Super Famicom. So I'm just going to slot that one back in in the correct spot. Bamboozle well, is a port of a European computer game, which explains a lot of things. That isometric perspective being top of the list. This is a puzzle game where your goal is to detonate all of the bombs on the stage. But blowing up the bombs destroys the terrain and bombs will set off bombs that they're close to. So the puzzles consist of finding out which bombs you have to destroy in which order, possibly moving a few if you're able to, and working out where you can safely stand as the bombs go off. Just about anything will kill you, getting caught in an explosion, walking into the water, getting hit by some obstacles in the map, and there's a lot of stages where you'll do something innocuous and you wind up dead. At least every stage has a password, and you can always pick up right where you left off. Technically, there's 130 stages in Bamboozle. And I say technically, because you can't really access the last 49. Stage 80 cannot be cleared, so you'll have to look up the password for stage 81 and pick up from there. I guess that really does make this one an impossible game. Well, after that rocky start, here we have a classic. Act Razor will always be remembered as the game where you have to beat some really tough platforming stages so that you can get back to the fun part. So to be fair, I found the kingdom building portions to be kind of dull after the first time you've played. There's no room for creativity or alternate approaches there. You just methodologically fill in the map. The first time through, that's pretty cool. After that, it's a lot of waiting around for people to do things. But as I said, it's really the action stages that earned Act Razor its spot on this list. Your jumping's always a little bit stiffer than you'd like, your attack isn't quite as responsive as you'd want, many of the stages wind up just being large sprawls, and plenty of the bosses wind up being pretty cruel. In fact, I would say it's the very last stage that really marks Act Razor down as one of the toughest games on the Super Famicom. Because it's a boss rush where you use up resources that can't be replenished, 
fight your way through most of the bosses that you've defeated, and then have to take on a super boss, where a game over means doing it all over again. There's a lot of people who beat all of Axe Razor except that final stage. SD The Great Battle kicked off what became a major 16-bit franchise. There were five Great Battle games released on the Super Famicom. That said, it wasn't the first game in its own franchise. It was a spin-off of the Compati Hero series, a loose collection of games by Bon Presto that brought together popular characters from Gundam, Ultraman, and Kamen Rider. The Great Battle series was their action franchise, and this first stage has top-down action where you can switch freely between those three characters, though for the most part while you're walking around and fighting, it doesn't make a difference who you're using. The key difference for them is their special attack, and for the most part you're going to want to save that for bosses. Now 90% of SD The Great Battle is not a difficult game. The bad jumping mechanics are your worst enemy. But there's one dark stage where you can only see things in a very tight ring around your character, something that I know every player loves to encounter. And the final boss has a trick that's especially frustrating. In that last battle, your controls are reversed. So this isn't the most fun game to kick off a big franchise. Darius Twin has the distinction of being the first Darius game made exclusively for a console. All of the previous games in the series were originally in the arcade, and Darius Twin is inspired by Darius 2. The twin in the title being a reference to that, and the fact that two players can play simultaneously. Darius Twin might have been made for a console, but that doesn't mean they made a lot of concessions for the home player. Okay, maybe a little concession, since you can turn up the number of lives that you start with. But the action itself? It's still brutally difficult. You have to pound even the weakest of enemies multiple times with shots before they go down. And your power-up progression is very slow. You'll be on the third stage before you can even upgrade your main gun properly. You retain your power-ups after you die, so it's not as brutal as some other shoot-'em-ups. But the action's furious, and you're going to have to memorize these stages if you want to do well. This game has the traditional branching paths that the Darius series is known for, which can be a whole nother hurdle for mastery. Shoot'em ups were on their way out as a genre when the Super Famicom was released. Over the next few years, a lot of great companies that specialize them are either going to have to switch to something else or shut down entirely. But because it's a genre that is so focused on challenge, they wind up being very well represented on this list. Draken has the honor of being the first RPG released on the Super Famicom, and it's nothing like most of the RPGs that you're going to find on the system. The Super Famicom becomes best known in Japan as an RPG powerhouse, but almost all of those RPGs were developed in Japan. Draken is a port of a European computer game, and it brings with it some very interesting sensibilities. The most impressive thing about the game is that 3D rendered terrain that you explore. The least impressive is uh, everything else. If you encounter an enemy, combat is automatic. You can tell your party members how you'd like them to behave, but they'll do everything all on their own. When you enter some areas, you'll switch to more of an adventure game view, where you control each one individually, moving them around the screen to interact with objects. Draken is best remembered for having an absolutely absurd number of ways that you could just suddenly die. Walk onto the wrong piece of terrain, which is easy to do because controlling your party's movement is tough, and you encounter a shark that will instantly kill anyone it attacks. If you go exploring at night, then the stars themselves may descend to try to kill you. Doing innocuous things will put you in unwinnable battles and that makes it very difficult to get a feel for what you're supposed to be doing at the very beginning of the game. Draken is obtuse and completely hostile to anyone who's playing it, which would be how it got its spot as one of the 100 impossible games. A week after Draken, Ghidlin became the first Japanese-developed RPG for the Super Famicom, and it's a much more traditional game. In fact, 
so traditional, there isn't a whole lot to talk about it. It's just about the most generic RPG that you can find. It's based on a series of novels about an astronaut who crashes on the planet Gidleen, and it's one of those planets where magic is real, so he uses his ray gun to fight wizards. That's a concept that wasn't especially fresh even in 1991. The reason it's on the impossible games list is due to a quirk in how it handles damage calculation. In combat, critical hits occur about 5-10% to of the time. And that goes for both you and enemies. You still have to connect to get the critical hit, and enemies have very low hit rates at the start of the game at least. A critical hit always does 12 times your normal damage. It creates a situation that you just can't stay ahead of. Any critical hit from virtually any enemy will be fatal. So every combat has the chance of you just dropping dead. It made Gidleen especially frustrating to play. It's probably not an RPG that anyone would want to go back to. Even if you're a fan of the Gundam franchise, you might be saying to yourself, I don't remember an F-91 Gundam. And that's because the movie Kido Senshi Gundam F-91 ranks among the least popular pieces of Gundam media. It was an attempt to reboot the franchise, and needless to say, it did not work. The Super Famicom came out in a bit of a dark age for Gundam, so we're going to see a few tie-in games on this list for things that people generally don't like. And I'm going to tell you right up front, F91 is a bad game. Even if it wasn't completely bewildering to play, there's just nothing here. The best thing about the game are the animations that occur when you fight, and that's not enough to hang a game on. The concept is you're only driving the F90 Gundam. You'll get the F91 at the end of the game. And every battle has a certain number of enemy units and a certain number of friendly units, and they kind of lazily drift toward each other. You have to select your Gundam and move them into enemy forces, and that will trigger a very, very, very long battle sequence. During this, your goal is solely to maneuver the radar in the lower right-hand corner so that enemy units are in the quadrant in front of you, then hit the A button. Then hit the A button again so that you'll attack, and then hit up and down to highlight which weapon you're going to use. It doesn't tell you how likely you are to hit or how much damage each one does, so you'll have to feel your way through that. Sometimes the enemy will fire back, and this seems to just occur at random intervals. Battles like this take about 3 or 4 minutes to resolve because the enemies are damage sponges, and once you clear them all out, you get to do it again. If the enemy close in and destroy all of the friendly units other than you, then you lose. And the troops on your side of the fight tend to be very fragile. So that's just one more thing to get frustrated by while you play. It's a tough game, but I think it's more tough to understand what to do than it is to execute. Sometimes I feel like shoot 'em up developers just enjoy being cruel. Super R-Type is a port of R-Type 2. If you want the original R-Type, you can go play it on the PC Engine. And since it's a shoot 'em up, of course it's difficult, but Super R-Type takes things one step beyond. The extra challenge in Super R-Type is that when you die, you go back to the beginning of the stage. And that includes when you're fighting bosses. It puts a real wall on your progress. Of course, there's other things that make the game tough. The game's a real showcase of the slowdown that plagued a lot of early Super Famicom games, and since Super R-Type is a game that requires a lot of precise movement, suddenly having the game go slow can be a real problem. And of course, Super R-Type is one of those shoot-'em-ups where when you die, you lose all of your power-ups, so you might be better starting over if that happens. Now all of that said, I don't think Super R-Type is that tough on the scale of shoot 'em ups on the Super Famicom. Yeah, when you die to a boss, you're gonna throw your controller across the room in anger. But it also means that you're really mastering those stages before you reach the boss. I actually think it winds up making the game easier in the long run. 
And even when you're fully powered down, your ship isn't helpless. You can charge your weapon up twice and get a super powerful blast that bosses have a hard time standing up to. That doesn't make it easy for you, but it gives you a chance to survive on most of the later stages. While I like the game, Super R-Type isn't one I'd pick out as an impossible game. Now here's a game that if it wasn't on the list, everyone would be asking where it was. Cho Makaimura is one of the definitive impossible games. Maybe not the hardest game in the world, but one that is known for being a challenge. This is the first console exclusive game in the series, and part of that is due to the game being designed around the capabilities of the Super Famicom. One of the big features of the system was scaling and rotating an image layer. And like a lot of early Famicom games, there's several points in the game that demonstrate that feature. As in the previous games, Arthur is a knight who launches projectiles when he attacks, gets knocked out of his armor and into his underwear when he gets touched, and has to rescue a princess that's been abducted by the forces of hell. One of the big additions in this version of the game is that he can now double jump. Arthur's always had one of those jumps that always goes the same height and same distance, requiring that players really commit to their action. The double jump can be used anytime you're in the air, but it's another jump that acts exactly the same way. You can jump backwards with it, but you're still gaining the same height and have to travel the same distance. It both gives you more maneuverability in the air, while still making platforming tricky. The jump mechanics are only one of the things that make Cho Makemura difficult. You're also facing a constant stream of enemies. Almost all of your weapons are never quite as effective as you want. And power-ups are hidden and rare. Even continues aren't infinite here. You have to collect money bags and buy them when you get a game over. Of course, the most infamous cruelty of the game is that when you reach the end of it, the game's not over. You're set back to the beginning and have to complete the whole thing again, and you have to have a special weapon equipped once you reach the end. Do that, and you can face the final boss and beat the game. Cho Makaimura is a brutally difficult game, but it's one that plays fair with you. Well, at least until it tells you you have to do that second loop. And here we have an entirely different kind of challenge. Lemmings was originally a computer game by DMA Designs, who would go on to change their name to Rockstar after they found some other game series to work on. And it was one of the monster puzzle game hits of the early 90s. A game that everyone and their mother played. Literally. It was ported to around 20 different platforms at the time. If you had something capable of running software, then you could probably play Lemmings on it. The concept of the game was simple. A door would open, and the little blue lemmings would drop out of it. They would march in a straight line until they hit a wall, then turn around and keep marching in a straight line. If it took them off a cliff or into other danger, well, they still kept going. The player's goal was to get these lemmings to an exit door. And on every stage you had to get a certain percentage of the lemmings to it. And to deal with that, you had a variety of abilities that you could trigger for each lemming, letting them do things like dig out tunnels, or build bridges, or climb over obstacles. The challenge came from figuring out how to build that path to get your lemmings from that entrance to the exit without losing too many of them. There were over 100 stages to take on in lemmings, and the later ones could be a real challenge. The Super Famicom port of lemmings is actually pretty good, its biggest weakness is that you can't use a mouse. But the game doesn't really require that kind of precision or rapid movement of the cursor to make it unreasonable to play this way. The challenge exclusively comes from solving the puzzles. Though that said, I personally have never had that much difficulty with Lemmings as a puzzle game. The solution to way too many of the later puzzles is trap all of your Lemmings except one in a small area and then have that free one go to the goal and work on constructing a path backwards. So while I like the game, Lemmings isn't what I'd reach to for a difficult puzzle game. 
I have to use the full title of SD Gundam Gaiden Night Gundam Monogatari Oinari Uisan because there's an awful lot of SD Gundam games and even an awful lot of SD Gundam Gaiden Night Gundam Monogatari games. The game has a weird lineage of being part of an RPG spin-off, of a collectible sticker spin-off, of a comedy spin-off, of a military science fiction series. And since there's a continuous story with the Famicom RPGs in this series, I guess this is the 16-bit spin-off of all of that. And despite all of that weird background, this is a bog-standard RPG of the era. According to the book, the reason it's on the list is because sometimes you'll be attacked by strong enemies that you're not ready to face yet. And to that I say, well, of course, it's an RPG from 1991. I'm going to go ahead and put this out right now, since we're still kind of early on here. I disagree with the inclusion of most of the RPGs on this list. I don't find RPGs of this era difficult, just taxing. Generally speaking for these games, if you ever encounter something difficult, it means that you need to go back a little bit and then fight the enemies there until you can buy better equipment or have powered up enough to continue. All it's doing is testing your patience. There are going to be some RPGs on the list that demand a bit more care and thought from the player. And those are the more interesting ones here. This Night Gundam Monogatari game, though, this is just an RPG that requires you to sit in one spot and grind a lot longer. And speaking of games with weird lineages, Thunder Spirits is a port of the arcade game Thunder Force AC, which itself was a port of the Mega Drive shoot 'em up Thunder Force 3. So we've got a copy of a copy situation going on. The reason this isn't called Thunder Force is that Sega owned the name, even though Technosoft owned the game. Thunder Spirits also presented an extra layer of difficulty for me. This is the first shoot 'em up I've talked about in this video. They didn't have a built-in auto-fire function. So I had to mash the A button continuously to shoot. Unfortunately, they put the switch weapons button on the R, which meant I could mash it about one quarter my regular rate with my thumb and still have the ability to switch weapons, or I could use my index finger to mash at my proper speed and not be able to switch anything. There's not even an option screen where you can change the button configuration. That's just bad interface design right there. Even without that difficulty though, Thunder Spirits is hard. I mean, brutally hard. It's very high speed for a shoot 'em up on the Super Famicom. It has a tendency to throw enemies right at you, and they're spitting out attacks the moment they appear on the screen. You will have to memorize stages to make any progress here. And capping it off, this is one of those games that has limited continues. That's not a surprise for a game from this era, but it does mean you'll have to be good at the game before you even can practice later stages. I actually happen to enjoy the Thunder Force series quite a bit, though I think Thunder Spirits is my least favorite of them. I'd play these on the Mega Drive before the Super Famicom. But this isn't 100 impossible Mega Drive games to play, so Thunder Spirits has definitely earned its place. I feel like the entry for this game should just be one long sigh. Dragon Ball Z Super Saiyan Densetsu, or Dragon Ball Z Legend of the Super Saiyan, has some long 8-bit history behind it. After creating one truly awful Dragon Ball game for the Famicom, Bandai decided that they would instead milk the franchise by making the same game over and over again. And that game was a merger between a board game and an RPG that had the player use cards to attack and defend in combat. This is the fifth game they made in that style, and they'd still make another two on the Famicom. But one problem that this series had was that the ongoing story of Dragon Ball didn't line up nicely with video game releases. And so on multiple occasions, the video games had to make up climaxes to the major storylines. Dragon Ball Z Super Saiyan Densetsu is the most RPG-like of these games. You can wander around freely, you get into fights, and then you play your cards. The number in the top left is attack, the bottom right is defense, 
and you attack everyone if you play a card whose symbol matches the character's symbol. The symbols have other effects, like letting your opponent have a powerful counterattack, or letting you use a special ability. But here's the thing about this one. This game's trivially easy. Even by RPG standards of the time, there's maybe two or three fights that require a little bit of grinding to deal with, so there's nothing here in terms of difficulty. I've got no clue why this would be considered to be an impossible game. The most I can get is that some of the characters are actively hostile toward you and won't necessarily follow your order in battle. But even that's not a real hardship in this game. Those are annoyances, not difficulty. The hardest thing about playing this one is staying awake. So I said most RPGs aren't really difficult to play through. Well, the Romancing Saga series is the exception that proves the rule. This is an RPG where it's possible to play it wrong and make the game virtually impossible to complete. The Saga series is known for having confusing, often user-hostile game mechanics. Most of the challenge in Romancing Saga developed from what Square called the Free Scenario System. Essentially, Romancing Saga is wide open. You can go where you want, do what you want, and they don't give you a whole lot of direction. The story advances if you just go to the correct place. That's not a problem in itself. In fact, that's the way a lot of the earliest computer RPGs worked. But Romancing Saga adds a cruel little knife twist on top of that. Your characters don't advance with experience points or by moving through the story. The actions that you take in battle determine how they grow. And simultaneously, the power of the monsters that you're facing also increase as you battle. The more battles you have, the stronger the monsters that you'll face. So if you haven't been advancing your characters properly as you fight, then you could find yourself in an effectively unwinnable state toward the end of the game. And despite these and some other mechanical complications, Romancing Saga is one of the most beloved RPGs on the Super Famicom. People who love complicated game mechanics love this series. It's just that the things that make people love it are real stumbling blocks for people coming to it for the first time. Contra Spirits is another game where if it wasn't on this list of impossible games, it would be notable for its absence. Contra Spirits is one of two games that can duke it out for the title of Best Run and Gun. It's one of the pinnacles of 16-bit action, and yes, it's also kind of hard. But the game has a small secret to it. If you're not playing it on hard difficulty, you're not getting the whole game. This isn't one of those games where if you play on hard, they double the boss's health and call it a day. Instead, it changes the enemy patterns, gets the bosses to do more, and adds one extra fight to the game. Basically, if you play Contra Spirits on hard mode, then you get to play more Contra. And that is definitely worth it. But even if you don't turn up the difficulty, Contra Spirits is still a challenging game. The slightest touch from anything will kill you, and the stages are intense. They're also some of the most memorable set pieces that you'll find in a Super Famicom game. All in all, this is one of the least surprising entries on the list. It's an impossible game, and you definitely want to beat it. Can I gush about the Rocketeer for a few seconds? Not the game, the game's notoriously awful. I mean the movie. Yeah, it totally failed to find an audience in cinemas, but I loved it. A tribute to movie serials that integrated so much Hollywood lore from the 1930s, and it has one of the greatest film scores of all time, which the game doesn't use. The comic it's based on is pretty good too, though I prefer the way the movie uses the material. You'd think an action hero with a jetpack would be an easy thing to build a game on, but the Rocketeer for the Super Famicom suffers from an unfortunate curse. European computer game design. The game was originally developed for computers, and Nova Logic took one of the common approaches from the era and made a bunch of cinematic mini-games. Put some heavy air quotes around that cinematic. Basically, mini-games that emphasized visual design and looking pretty over being playable. 
the air race that comprises the first several stages of the game is a good example of this, as three quarters of the screen is taken up by a cinematic view that's useless for playing, and you're actually controlling the action in a tiny postage stamp window at the bottom of the screen. Later stages don't fare much better. The design attitude was, why make one bad game when you could make six of them, and then make people play the same bad game multiple times to pad out the length. Besides these flight sim stages, there's also shooting galleries where you just point your cursor at characters that pop out, and shoot em ups that go very slow and drag on for a very long time. If you can get past that first stage air race, the game becomes much, much easier. But that first stage is virtually impossible. There aren't many players who have ever managed to clear it. If you don't know what you're doing, then you've got no hope of even seeing most of the game. While I didn't think this at the time, Smash TV feels like a real throwback. The arcade game felt like a more advanced version of a game from 1983. Robotron 2084 is the obvious antecedent, since Smash TV is a twin-stick shooter, though on the Super Famicom, the buttons act as the other stick. You've just got a series of square arenas, and you're trying to rack up score. There isn't a whole lot to the game, you enter a room, hordes of enemies come at you, you shoot them until there's no more enemies, and then you move on. Sometimes you collect power-ups, sometimes you collect money and prizes. And I know that in the past couple seconds, a fairly large number of you watching this video went, Big money! Big prizes! I love it! Smash TV is really burned into the consciousness of players of a certain age. But not in Japan and not just because the host speaks English in the Japanese game. The arcade game never caught on over there, so the Super Famicom game was just a weird curiosity. The book calls it out as a tedious game where everything is the same, and notes that the bosses are extra hard. And I can't really dispute that the bosses are difficult. They have an absolutely absurd amount of health, and you're going to have to shoot them for three or four minutes straight to have any effect. And as an arcade-style game, it really was designed to munch your quarters. Any little touch will do you in, and the game can often be unfair with the enemies and bosses. That said, I still like it a lot. I've even beaten it without cheating. Though these days, I just pop it in to play around and go, yeah, that was fun, and move on. Actually, playing through to the end is a bit much. Rushing Beat is another one of those games where I go, why is this even on the list? I understand wanting a few entries from the beat-em-up genre to be on the list. It's a genre that can be pretty tricky. But Rushing Beat? Really? It's both not as difficult and not as good as others I could think of. It doesn't even feature particularly complex combat. You've got one button for attack and one button for jump, and that's it. At least there are two characters who each have a different moveset. There are some quirks to Rushing Beat that make the game more difficult, but I don't think they're difficult ones to master. You can't knock enemies out of their attacks, for example, so there's no interrupting them, which just teaches you to keep away from enemies until you know there's going to be a gap. Many of the melee weapons that are dropped by your opponents, including the bosses, are significantly less effective than your own fists so it's better to ignore those weapons lying on the ground and just keep punching people. And finally, for some weird reason, enemy damage doesn't show up until after you get up from being knocked down. You go into a hyper attack mode when you're knocked below 50% health. It's actually kind of hard to see it coming because of that delay in telling you how much damage you've taken. One thing that Jalico did to try to make the game more difficult is really crank up the damage that enemies can do. A couple of blows from a common enemy can take off a third of your health bar. So this is a game where you really do have to play cautiously. But it's not difficult to play cautiously. You're just playing more slowly. Rushing Beat always felt like a bad copy of better, more challenging games. I'd much rather have one of those on the list. 
I could gush about Ultima 6 for a long time. A completely continuous, open world RPG. And it was totally persistent. Move a spoon around someone's table, come back three months later, and it was still in the same spot. Maybe they should have done dishes. There was an elaborate story, a vast world to explore, and a dramatic shift toward adventure-style play rather than RPG. And a lot of that got mangled in the console port. Ultima 6 was a computer RPG first, which meant that it had a hard drive for handling large amounts of information and saving all of the changes that you made to the world. The Super Famicom's memory was just too limited to store all of that, and those ROM chips were a lot more expensive than floppy disks. So Ultima 6 on the Super Famicom divided the world up into much smaller chunks and lost a lot of the fine detail that allowed for novel solutions and dynamic play. But even though it's an RPG coming from the computer side of things, that didn't make it more difficult. In fact, the game is fairly easy. While it is open-ended and you can do a lot of things in whatever order you like, you're given the basic outline of your quest at the very start. Apparently some players of the Super Famicom version had trouble grasping what the game wanted from them. They couldn't even figure out how to get out of the starting castle. And all that requires is learning how to interview people and move objects around. There's also an issue that a lot of the game's information is offloaded to the manual, particularly the complex magic system. But I think having to read the manual isn't a real hurdle. The combat in the game is never difficult. If you just go around talking to people and helping them out, you'll quickly be overpowered for the entire game. Ultima 6 is a long game, it's complicated, but it's pretty far from impossible. Othello was one of the very first games to have a very thorough AI developed for it. Even an 8-bit computer with next to no RAM can have an Othello AI capable of trouncing just about anyone. Othello World is intended to give you a ladder of Othello opponents to climb, and it even has a bit of a tutorial mode with its first opponent, where it talks you through some basic strategy. But there's a catch. That first opponent is nearly impossible to beat. You have to be good at Othello to even see the second stage here. Most players are just going to bash their head against their wall at that first stage forever. And if they get a lucky break somehow, every opponent after that is tougher. They don't even have difficulty settings for Othello World, so you can't turn it down. The AI you're playing against starts at kind of hard and just keeps increasing. If you manage to beat this one, then you're really an Othello master. Maka Maka might seem like just another RPG, but this is another game that's impossible to beat. And I mean literally impossible to beat. When you defeat the final boss, the game crashes. But even beyond that, Maka Maka is widely regarded as one of the worst games on the Super Famicom. An RPG overwhelmed by bugs, and packed with humor that I'm not quite fit to judge, but Japanese players seem to hate a lot. There's also a random encounter rate that is astronomically high, and based on the number of steps that you take. So there's not even tricks you can use to get around it. There's also plenty of enemies that can completely devastate you, even if you have a prepared party. Like some that will just suddenly repel all of your damage back at you. The characters used in the title are a reference to Buddhism, but the title means absolutely nothing. It's nonsense. That at least is probably what the developers were going for, given the nonsensical nature of the game itself. In fact, the game is so absurd that people aren't sure if some things are bugs or intentional. For example, the final boss only has one hit point. There's certain party members that if you heal them above their maximum health, they'll die after the next hit. And many character abilities just don't work. Is it because they were trying to be funny? Or is it because it wasn't functional? There are enemies that can drain your level and grant you additional levels. Except if you're granted a level by an enemy, then you don't get any of the abilities that you'd earn by advancing to that level normally. 
Because of the way characters position themselves before the final confrontation, it's possible to save your game in an unwinnable state right at the end. Makamaka was such a disaster that it's blamed for the death of its publisher Sigma, who probably pushed the game out the door to get any kind of money because they were out of cash. In a strange way, it's so bad that it's almost a recommendation to play it, because you'd need to experience this kind of thing to believe it. And that does make it an impossible game that people want to beat. The original Heracles no Echo was the first RPG on the Famicom to follow in the Dragon Quest mold. There were only three RPGs on the system before it, and two of those were Dragon Quest games. That meant that the original game had some distinctive mechanics, because people still hadn't really firmed up what an RPG on a console would be like. Heracles no Echo 3, on the other hand, is a standard console RPG of 1992 vintage. It doesn't even have a Bronze Age theme going with a generic medieval fantasy setting. That said, it is one of the most beloved RPGs on the Super Famicom. It's revered mainly for the story, which was by the same person who would go on to write Final Fantasy VII. While I don't think the game is especially challenging, there is one aspect to it that can be a bit of a hurdle for players. In battle, you only control the main character. Everyone else acts according to their personality. So you'll have party members who won't quite do what you want them to. Beyond that, as your party members level up, enemies become more difficult. It's still the same enemies that you'll be facing, they just become stronger. So this is one of those RPGs where you're on a treadmill where you're never really getting more powerful. One more trick to the game is that you have to visit certain temples and fountains in order to gain magical abilities, and that means whenever the story forces you to change out your party, you have to go on a world tour, visiting all of them again to make sure that your party is at full strength. But I don't think these things are really great challenges that a player has to overcome. It's just a little bit more work rather than a real challenge. Heracles no Echo 3 becomes one of those games that makes me go, why is this even on the list? Now here's one of my favorite games on the Super Famicom. It's one that I don't find to be especially difficult, but I understand why a lot of people do. In Camel Tree, you have exactly three controls. You can rotate the world to the left, you can rotate the world to the right, and if the marble is resting on a surface, you can do a little hop. And from that comes a game that always brings me fun. Camel Tree was originally an arcade game, but the Super Famicom's scaling and rotation abilities meant that the game could be ported to it extremely well. And some of you may have already noticed the challenging thing about this game. If you're prone to any kind of motion sickness, Camel Tree is effectively unplayable. You have to spin that screen awfully fast in order to complete the game, and a lot of people found themselves just unable to do that. The goal on every stage is to navigate the marble through that maze and to the goal. The marble will always fall down, which is why you have to rotate the maze around it so that it will fall towards where you want. There are some obstacles in the maze that will slow you down, some sections where you'll have to smash through bricks, and it becomes a game of just trying to maintain your momentum and constantly move in the same direction. And that means that when you get going, the game has a really good flow to it. When you're zipping through twisting passageways, not touching any walls because you're manipulating things exactly right, it feels great. And while there isn't a wide variety of obstacles you'll encounter, it's not like adding more stuff would improve the game. There's four groups of levels that you can choose from at the start, but there's also advanced courses that will unlock after you complete the set. Camel Tree winds up being a relatively short game, but it's one that I think gives you a fun challenge. Jordan Meshner's Prince of Persia is a game that's been ported to just about everything. He wrote it for the Apple II, but it's been released on about two dozen different platforms, and those are only the official releases. The game's enormously influential, basically becoming the foundation of the cinematic platformer genre. A game genre that emphasizes smooth movement of the character over fine control. 
That means it can be a little bit tough to get a feel for how to move around, but once you do, the action gets a distinctive flow to it, and you'll be making dramatic leaps and dangling off ledges in no time. One of the trickiest things about the game is the time limit. Originally, you had 60 minutes to complete the whole thing, but the Super Famicom is a unique port of Prince of Persia. You have 120 minutes to complete the game. However, they basically doubled the length of the game, adding in a huge number of new stages as well as some additional bosses. I don't think every edition that they made works, but even if you were already a Prince of Persia fan on other platforms, it gave you a reason to play the Super Famicom version. Even Stage 1, which you're seeing me play through here, is greatly expanded. Because the time limit is so tight, most players repeat a stage until they get a good time in it, write down the password that they get afterwards, and then repeat that process on the next stage. You don't want to be down to the last few seconds when you're engaged in a dramatic sword fight with the final boss. The time limit's not the only complicated thing, though. Sword fighting is not as intuitive as it could be, Everyone's going to screw up and put away their sword at least once, and then get killed instantly. And your only moves are to attack or block. And a lot of the challenge in the game comes down to finding the right pressure plate to stand on, and then getting through a gate before it slams shut. But even with the game's limitations, Prince of Persia has some amazing moments that anyone who's played it will never forget. That is not an error on my part. Light Fantasy just happens to be the first entry in the Super Famicom list where they didn't include all of the ratings. At least Light Fantasy is known for being an extremely difficult RPG. You have the ability to recruit almost anyone to your party, monsters and townspeople alike, so if you actually do that, you'll find yourself in a lot of trouble. The game also lets you save whenever you want, so that's convenient. The problems begin when you actually try to fight enemies. All the combat takes place on a tactical map that takes a very long time to play out. 15 minute combats against regular enemies isn't unheard of in the game. Light Fantasy is another RPG on this list where as you battle enemies, the enemies become stronger. Maybe there was something in the water in 1992. On top of that, they gave the monsters a variety of status ailments to inflict, and a lot of them effectively knock a character out of combat. The one item that can cure every status ailment is very rare and can't even be used in some battles. And then you have extremely limited inventory space, so you can't be prepared for every situation. Melee weapons are ineffectual in combat to the point where you won't even want to use them. In fact, you can't even attack the final boss with melee equipment. Flight Fantasy is a game that puts up enormous hurdles for the player. And if you aren't following a guide as you play, there's a very real chance that you'll get yourself stuck. This one is just a punishing RPG. Well, we've reached the one quarter mark of this list, and I wanted to give people a natural break point. So if you wanted to get up and use the restroom, or even stop and come back after a while, this is a good time for it. In the previous video I did on the Famicom half of the list, I use these breaks to talk about the books in my Famicom collection, but I'm not really collecting Super Famicom books, so I don't have anything to talk about there. But it turns out that a lot of these impossible games from the book had other versions that you could play on the Super Famicom, assuming you had a Super Game Boy. So as I progress here, we're going to take a quick look at a few of those. The Saga RPG franchise, for example, got its start on the Game Boy. And just like with the Super Famicom, there's three entries in the series on it, they're all mechanically very different, and they have a bad tendency to be a bit impenetrable to newcomers. A bit more interesting are the direct ports. R-Type 2 was ported to the Super Famicom as Super R-Type, but there was also an R-Type 2 for the Game Boy. It plays very slowly, it's extremely stripped down, and yet it's still absurdly difficult. Konami seems to have gone a bit crazy when they ported Contra the Alien Wars to the Game Boy. It's a weirdly faithful adaptation, just brought down enough that it's playable on that tiny portable system. They managed to get a weird amount of the Super Famicom game on the go here. Another case of simultaneous ports would be the Game Boy's version of Prince of Persia, 
though that one is a direct port of the computer game. No enhancements like the Super Famicom version got. It's surprisingly functional for a game move to a tiny system like that. And it wasn't only Super Famicom games that were getting Game Boy ports. A lot of other classic games moved to that system, including the Tower of Duraga, one of the big stars of the 100 Impossible Famicom games. The Game Boy port is actually a lot easier because it gives your character hit points and you can level them up, but there are additional tower challenges if you felt like you needed to take it further. I think that's enough for now. We need to get back to the actual topic at hand. But we'll check in 25 games from now and see a few more Game Boy versions of Impossible Games. Proteus Da is actually the first game in the list of the 100 Impossible Super Famicom games. Somehow they got the release date completely wrong. It's a very late port of the first Parodius arcade game, coming after the Famicom and PC Engine versions, among others. Parodius is Konami's parody of their own Gradius series of shoot 'em ups, and as a parody, it's almost mechanically identical to the original game. Parodius gives you funnier graphics, often with cute little animations as the enemies try to get you. A few alternate characters, typically taken from other Konami games like Twin B, and the bell items from Twin B, which you can shoot multiple times to rotate through different power ups. But beyond those temporary bell power ups, the regular power up system is the same as Gradius. You collect capsules dropped by enemies, each capsule advances the bar at the bottom of the screen, and you can activate it when it reaches the point on the bar for a power up you want. You'll want to avoid the exclamation point question mark block because that will reset you back to nothing. And every ship has a particular loadout that's really good for it. As I'm playing with Twin B here, the missiles for it have been replaced with a rocket punch that's much more effective than the guns it can get. One of the key challenges of Konami's shoot 'em ups is that later stages often rely on you being fully powered up. And if you get destroyed, then when you start over again, you have nothing. And at many points in the game, you really can't recover from that. You'll just keep getting killed over and over again. Parodius is one of the key games in the cute em up genre, the subgenre of shoot em ups that feature an adorable art style. But behind that sweet facade, cute em ups often have a deep loathing of humanity, a desire to hurt as many people as possible, perhaps by luring them in first with their cartoonish, colorful graphics. And that would be why Parodius Da is on a list of impossible games to beat. Hook for the Super Famicom is easily the best thing about Hook the movie. The film is often pointed to as Steven Spielberg's worst movie, and I have a really hard time disputing that. I really hate that one. But the game is decent. At least the Super Famicom game is decent. Don't play any other games based on Hook. The game has you step into the shoes of an adult Peter Pan, and you want to traverse Neverland to save your kids from Captain Hook. It's a decent game, but not especially remarkable. The two things that stand out for me with it are the visual design and how you can fly if you get some pixie dust. The book says it's on the list because the controls are a little bit tricky to use. It's just that Peter has a little bit of momentum to him his attacks don't quite have the reach that you might like. That doesn't really make the game extremely difficult to me. Now, in total fairness to the book, I did find some other Japanese players who felt that the game was way too difficult. So perhaps my supreme gaming skills just let me get used to the controls a lot quicker than most. Or maybe I've played enough really awful games that a control scheme with just a bit of inertia to it doesn't bother me at all. Well, either way, I don't find the game to be especially difficult. And it's so unmemorable, I wonder why it's even here. Zandra no Daiboken has a bit of a weird history behind it. The game's a spin-off of the Valkyrie no Boken series. Zandra, the main character of the game, is a creature that appears in those games. And for the Super Famicom outing, it takes a bit of a nasty turn. You know a game's going to be hard when they have to give you seven lives. There's no way to earn extra lives either, 
The seven that they give you at the beginning is all you get. Just controlling Zandra is a challenge. You have several attack options, and two of them will leave you vulnerable for an extended period if you miss. You can also charge up a super jump, but until you learn the trick to actually getting it to work, you'll get some very sporadic behavior. The trick is that even though when you're charging up you stop and squat in place, you have to be moving before you start charging up in order to get actual height from that super jump. Any little touch will kill you in this game, and while it looks easy, every time you stab downward with that pitchfork or launch yourself through the air, you're risking death. Zandra no Daiboken is also infamous for having a lot of bad endings. If you don't take the proper actions at the right time, Zandra could wind up being a zombie monster getting cut down by the Valkyrie, living out her days in a harem, or become a pirate on the high seas. Actually, that ending doesn't sound so bad. Apparently, that ending where Zandra becomes a monster scarred a lot of Japanese children. Zandra no Daiboken is a fairly difficult action game that requires some real precision. It has a few traps for the unwary, but it's still very well made and has a good look to it. It just happens to be brutally difficult with no margin of error. Civilian is a port of a fairly unusual arcade game. In that original version, you used a trackball to steer a snake-like dragon through a maze, spitting fire at any enemies that came near. Well, the Super Famicom doesn't have a trackball, but they do give you a few choices of control scheme. And to be honest, I don't think any of them work really well. Civilian is a game that I think becomes even more difficult due to a bad port. The dragon itself is your life bar. A body segment turns red every time you take damage. And unfortunately, if any part of your body comes into contact with anything, it counts as a hit. So you have this long snaking body, and enemies constantly appearing from all directions to come at you. While there are level obstacles in fixed positions, most enemies just appear. If you breathe fire on them, and then collect a little bit that comes out, it's possible to recover some health. But because enemies ignore terrain, that's easier said than done. Your fire also gets weaker the longer you use it, which just makes everything a bit more difficult. Later stages have you navigate narrow hallways lined with damaging traps on all sides. This is a game that will just beat you up, and the way it makes your dragon difficult to control really doesn't help. Sazan Ai's Sema Korinden is notorious as one of the more annoying Famicom RPGs. The game is based on a popular comic series about a boy who's pressed into service as the undying guardian of a mystical girl. Which is why the game doesn't end if he dies. You just get an instant game over if anyone else dies. And annoyingly, the game has a bad tendency to drop party members on you who die in one hit. Healing items in the game are notoriously bad. They come in two varieties. One that heals 10 hit points, and one that recovers your health to full. Your characters start with 300 hit points. Beyond that, the game is really boring. The footage of the game I recorded for this video has a lot of me wandering identical empty rooms for a long, long time before I finally have random encounters. It's strange because usually the problem with these bad RPGs is a really high encounter rate where you can't go more than two or three steps without getting into a fight. While here, the encounter rate is so low that you wind up doing nothing for three or four minutes at a time. Another notorious problem with the game was that travel cost $4,000, and you only gained a few dollars in every fight. So at story-appropriate moments, you had to stop and grind for a long time before you could get on the plane. There's one more thing that made this game extra difficult, and that was how the official strategy guide was wrong about a lot of things. So if you are following the book to make your life easier, you are going to find yourself in trouble. Shodai Naketsu Koha Kunio-kun is Kunio's first outing on the Super Famicom. 
the high school punk is an 8-bit mainstay, and his first game is basically the foundation of the entire beat-em-up genre. At this point, Kunio is basically Technos Japan's mascot, filling in whatever role they need him in for whatever game. You might think that moving to a new platform would mean a back-to-basics approach, but this is a whole new take on the Kunio concept. Kunio as an action RPG. The plot drops him off in Osaka for a school trip, and there he finds that Osaka is the most violent city in Japan. Wherever you go, anyone that you meet is capable of suddenly brawling with you. But that's okay because Kunio can also just walk up to anyone in the street and punch them too. Kunio doesn't have a lot of moves when starting out, so you have to level him up by beating up random passerbys. One of the things that makes the game difficult is that you'll gain NPC allies, and you can always punch each other along with the enemy. So if you're playing on your own, having someone there winds up being more of a hindrance than a help. But the real challenge in the game are the numerous game-breaking bugs, including some that will destroy your save game. The city of Osaka is modeled in enough detail for Kunio to explore it and get into fights, rather like the Yakuza series, and part of that involves visiting arcades and using crane machines, and the crane machines are infamous for corrupting your inventory in a way that crashes the game. So if you save your game after you've corrupted your inventory, well, you're stuck. The bugs weren't rare either. Most players encountered some kind of game-breaking situation that required that they would reload. Another problem is that the instruction manual seems to be describing a completely different game than this one. There's so many basic factual errors about the game in the manual that you can't really use it to learn how to play. Maybe they were trying to sell strategy guides with that one. As I've been recording footage for this video, I've been trying to not just use the first stage of games. I don't know if you notice it, but I definitely notice when people use supplemental footage of a video game, and it's something from the beginning of the first stage. I'm not able to get very deep with what I'm recording, but I do want to go deeper than that. Except in Axelay, the thing that the game is best known for is on the first stage, but not the second. And that's the dramatic foreshortening effect that the vertically scrolling stages have. The game alternates between vertical and horizontal scrolling, so stage 2 looks a lot more bland, and I'm not good enough at Axelay to be able to get to stage 3 in the time I had allotted to record. The key to Axelay is that rather than powering up your ship as you fly through the stages, it's about powering down. You select an array of three weapons before every stage, and you rotate through these by hitting L and R. The catch is that whenever you're hit, you lose the weapon you have equipped. And if you don't have any weapon equipped and you get hit, then your ship is destroyed. You might think that this would cause Axelay to be easy. After all, you can get hit four times before you die. But it feels like Konami took the requirement to hit you four times as a challenge. And they were going to make sure that it happened. The strange perspective on the vertically scrolling stages is known for throwing people off, especially when it comes to the terrain that you have to avoid colliding with. The narrow gaps and warped movement can be very confusing. Though it's useful to remember that the game is only distorted vertically, not horizontally. Axelay has multiple difficulty settings, but it's known for being extremely difficult, even on easy. I'm recording on normal difficulty, by the way. If you do a second loop of the game on hard, you get a special extreme difficulty, and on that level, the enemy placement goes from being tough to completely unfair. I think Axelay is the toughest Konami shoot 'em up on the Super Famicom. It came at a time when they were scaling back. After Axelay, they're pretty much only making Parodius shoot 'em ups. So, in a sense, Axelay is a last hurrah for Konami, and they wanted to give players a brutal challenge for that. After four side scrolling action games and three RPGs, the Hokuto Ken franchise finally reaches the genre that's a natural fit for the property a fighting game. But if you're a fan of the franchise, which is all about a tough guy wandering a post-apocalyptic wasteland and occasionally punching people until they explode, then you know one thing about Hokuto no Ken games. They're awful. For some reason, the franchise very rarely caught a break. 
to the point where one of the best regarded games that it has is an early 2000s fighting game best known for being comedically broken rather than annoyingly broken like the rest of them. In this case, we have a fighting game that has almost no special moves, the characters have almost no animation, they all move stiffly, there's a weirdly long delay when you press a button before they perform an attack, and when you're playing against the computer, all of their attacks have priority over yours. They can even sometimes stand within the hitbox of your attack and have nothing happen. It gets worse though, because if you're playing against your friends, some characters don't have ducking animations and thus can't do low attacks. And there's certain moves that just have no effect on some characters. It's an attempt to be faithful to the source material, but it's really annoying and not much fun. You have three different special moves with your characters. One, you have to hold down the R button to charge it up and then release, but you're allowed to do other moves and block while it's charging. The others are meters that build up as you perform attacks, and then you hit a button to trigger it. If you go up one meter, then you get one particular attack, and if you charge it all the way up to full, then you do a different one. Hokuto no Ken 6 is a fighting game that's hard not because the computer is so good at it, it's because the game is extremely poorly designed. This one's impossible in more ways than one. It's impossible because it's difficult, but it's also impossible because you're going to want to quit playing it long before you get to the end. Well, that's a Super Famicom box I'm not putting out on display. The Barbarossa in the title refers to Operation Barbarossa. For those that need the 30 second history lesson, Stalin and Hitler had teamed up to carve Poland up between them. But then after that, Hitler stabbed Stalin in the back and invaded Russia. And the Russian response to the invasion was delayed because Stalin couldn't believe that his new bestest buddy would do that to him. Barbarossa puts you in command of the German military during this operation. And it's a war game in the grand strategic sense. The maps are huge and you're commanding vast armies. Each unit on the map might represent hundreds of men. Now you're not seeing a whole lot of action in this video footage. And that's because of one of the things that makes this game absurdly difficult to complete. After you hit the end turn button, you might as well get up and make yourself a sandwich because you're going to be there a while. Opposing turns take about five minutes to resolve. You don't get to see what's happening either. There's just a screen telling you that it's currently the Soviet's turn and you have to wait it out. That's due to a lot of the game using a fog of war effect where you can only see things that are occurring right around your own units. The other thing that makes the game difficult is that your armies don't get a whole lot of resupply during your push on Moscow. What you have at the start of Scenario 1 is pretty much all you have for the whole game. So if you don't take good care of your forces, you're going to find yourself in an unwinnable state and likely have to go back tens of hours to start that long march through Russia all over again. Kiki Kai Kai Nazo no Kuro Mantle is the second Kiki Kai Kai game, and the first one designed for a console. This outing gives Shrine Maiden Sayo a new companion to team up with her, at least if you're playing two players. The game is an overhead run and gun. Not quite a shoot 'em up since it's not auto scrolling and you can double back, but it's a game very much built on those principles. Sayo has a rapid fire attack, so at least you're saving your mashing finger, and collect power ups to give her a spread shot or a fireball, and then strengthen those further. She also has a certain amount of magic that can be used as a screen clearing explosion, but her trickiest ability to use is the gohei that she swings, and that can deflect both enemies and shots. She's also picked up a dodge where she'll slide across the screen, though that has some lengthy recovery. And most vitally of all, Sayo no longer dies in a single hit. Now she has a life bar. Despite those things that should have made this an easier game, Kiki Kai Kai Nazo no Kuro Mantle is mainly known for being absurdly difficult. As you progress through the game, traps become extremely common, and you get really flooded with enemies. 
On top of that, whenever you get hit, you lose your power-ups. So it's difficult to maintain a state where you're strong enough to take on all the enemies you're facing. Even on the first stage, you're going to encounter situations where you're just flooded with opponents. The game never winds up really being unfair. It's more that it's specifically crafted to give you as hard of time as possible. While there are multiple difficulty levels, you'll have a really hard time telling the difference between easy and normal. Though the difference between those difficulties and hard is a lot more obvious. This one's a challenging game, and it still happens to be a pretty good one. This is one of the Super Famicom's more lively action games. You know, as much as I disliked Rushing Beat, I think Rushing Beat Ron is actually pretty good. They give you a big cast of characters, who all have more interesting moves, the combat feels smoother to play, the environments are more interesting. Though I am just going through a sewer here. My one personal complaint about the game is that it really leans into that final fight style. Those changes did bring a few problems though. Wendy, who I'm playing here, is actually the toughest character to use. Also, you pick two characters at the start, and the remaining three appear as bosses throughout the game. And one of those three, Lord J the Judo Master, is exceptionally difficult to defeat. Another change that gave the game more depth but also tripped people up is that you can carry recovery items around with you and then use them when you like. Or you can throw them at enemies, which hurts them and makes the item go away. If you do manage to make it to the final boss, you'll discover that they have a lot of moves that make them invincible for a short while. Something that isn't much fun and drags the fight out even longer. But all of that said, in the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, I think Rushing Beat Ron is actually relatively easy. There aren't a huge variety of enemies, which means it's easy to learn their moves. And your jump kicks and throw moves are both super powerful and capable of clearing away crowds of enemies. What it really comes down to is that this is a game that just happens to have some difficulty spikes. Perhaps the most impossible thing about Rushing Beat Ron is that it has this much improvement despite being released only nine months after the first game. The strangest thing about Roadrunner vs. Wile E. Coyote is who developed it. ICOM Simulations was an American software developer, and they were responsible for the Mac Venture line of games. Most of those games would later be ported to 8-bit consoles. Deja Vu, Shadowgate, and Uninvited. And after that critically acclaimed start, they wound up developing some fairly low-quality Looney Tunes-based games. Roadrunner vs. Wile E. Coyote is basically a Sonic the Hedgehog clone, except in this case, you're always trying to avoid the current trap from Wile E. Coyote. Almost all of the difficulty in the game comes from the fact that the controls are terrible. The game requires a lot of precise platforming to get around, but the Roadrunner's jumps float like he's a duck. On top of that, enemy positions, and the coyote himself, will often hit you and there's just nothing you can do about it. Making things worse is how the coyote often ignores terrain and flies around getting in your way. At least the Roadrunner can take more than one hit, but you're still going to get worn down awfully fast. Making things worse? There's no continues in the game. There's only 12 stages, and 4 of those are boss stages, but this is already a brutally difficult and unfair game. You're just going to get chewed up as you play this one. The best thing in the game are the end of level animations, and how there's a dedicated meep meep button. But that doesn't change how bland the game looks, or how it punishes you for trying to play it. This game will make you wonder how the Roadrunner kept getting away from that coyote in the first place. Mom, can I have a quarter to play Aliens vs. Predator? No, you have Aliens vs. Predator at home! I was one of many children fooled into thinking that this 16-bit game was a port of Capcom's all-time great arcade brawler. Unfortunately, to this day, the only official home port of that great game is on the completely insane Capcom Home Arcade stick. And I'd love to sit here and reminisce about how amazing that game is, 
but I have to talk about the terrible IGS brawler instead. And all the things that make it so awful to play also make it excessively difficult. You do next to no damage to the aliens as you're fighting them, so it takes a long time to wear down that massive health bar that they have. If you encounter any small aliens, like the eggs or facehuggers, you have to do a dash and then slide into them. If you're familiar with the US version, they actually changed that along with some other things to make the game easier. You have a special weapon that you can use, but it takes off a huge chunk of your health to use it, and it's not especially effective. Health recovery items are extremely rare, and you don't even get life back after you complete a stage. Any special weapons that you happen to find are single use only, you just grab them and throw them away. Hope you weren't fighting an alien at that moment since you're likely to throw it past the alien and not hit anything. The cloaking device is a weird situation, because if you get it, aliens will ignore you, and then you'll knock them off screen, and then you'll have to sit around for nearly a full minute waiting for the device to wear off before the aliens will come back on screen and you can hit them again. Okay, that one doesn't make the game more difficult, just more annoying. This game throws a steady stream of aliens at you. They can just choose to damage you, and there's very little that you can do about it. Even the bosses are unfair. The timing to hit this one is incredibly tight. And as I said, it's not like I recover my health after I beat it. Maybe if your moves weren't sluggish and slow and did no damage, and you had more options for things that you could do to your opponents, and health recovery wasn't absurdly rare, and the enemies weren't given a mile and a half long health bar, then this game would be more playable. It wouldn't be nearly as difficult, but when you're this unfairly brutal, I think it's okay to walk it back a notch. It's not uncommon for people to call Dordamon Japan's Mickey Mouse, and I'm not really fond of that because Dordamon doesn't really have a lot in common with Mickey Mouse. Mickey's more flexible than Dordamon, who has kind of a set story that he's locked into. On the other hand, that structure gives Dordamon something for people to latch onto, while Mickey is essentially reduced to just an icon. But the key to that comparison is that Dordamon is Japan's most beloved cartoon character. And as a result, he's had a lot of video games over the years. Dordamon Nobita to Yosei no Kuni is his first outing on the Super Famicom. And this first outing is, um, not actually a very good game. It's also not a difficult game, though. One that's more obtuse than it needs to be, one that doesn't really ease the players in, and one that lets you make stupid mistakes that will harm you later on. But it's really not that difficult. There's an RPG like Overworld, but that doesn't matter at all. You just get information on where to go for your next stage. In the stages, Right from the start, you're dealing with things like falling platforms and jumps that are a little bit tight, but it's about what you'd expect for, say, stage 3 of a game, rather than stage 1, and it never really gets more difficult than that. The biggest challenge is that there's a hidden item on all of the stages that's useful for the end of the game. Also on the first stage, your initial attack is very short range but then you almost immediately get a power-up that gives you a long-range attack, and that kind of neutralizes that. It is possible to bypass the treasure chests that contain items to give you power-ups, and that will make your life more difficult later on, but you can always revisit a stage to collect those. I feel like Doraemon Nobita to Yosei no Kuni isn't very good at carrying the flavor of Doraemon. The characters are there, but they're not really doing the things that they're known for. So I feel like this one falls down both on being an impossible game, and one I'd like to beat. Jojo no Kimyo no Boken adapts the third part of the popular comic franchise, otherwise known as the part that everyone likes to talk about. And, as appropriate to the title, it adapts it in the most bizarre way. The concept behind the game is that due to an inadvertent familial connection to a vampire, everybody in JoJo's family gets a superpower that manifests in the form of a ghost-like figure. 
The effects of these power manifestations are killing Jojo's mother, who will die in 50 days unless he can find and kill the vampire. And that sets off a globe-trotting adventure. That time limit is part of the game, and it's about the only thing that's actually difficult here. Even if you're familiar with the source material, you'll have a tricky time navigating to where you're supposed to go in order to advance the plot. The game is nominally an RPG, and you do have to buy improved equipment, even though that doesn't make a lot of thematic sense, and your characters will level up as they fight enemies. But there are no random encounters. Every fight is in a fixed location, and there's really only a handful of optional battles. That makes this play out a lot more like an adventure game, where you'll have to figure out where to go and what items to interact with. But the way that the game is restricted also means it isn't very difficult. As long as you don't loiter around in places, you're not going to have too much trouble. And once you know the critical path to get through, this is an extremely short game. Even if you play it normally, it's only about four hours long. In Japan, it's mainly known for being absurdly different from the source material. The power to stop the vampire at the end of the game comes from finding a magic hat for Jojo. That's something I should give any fan of the original pause. As an impossible game, though, it's really not that... We're back to the Great Battle series with the Great Battle 3, and this time it's one that I actually think is a decent game. Not top tier, but good enough. This game sends the Compati heroes into a medieval fantasy setting, where they have to quest to defeat an evil wizard. And as before, you've got characters from Gundam, Kamen Rider, and Ultraman. This time, the game is a beat-em-up, and it's actually a technically complex one. You've got a decent amount of moves available to you, including a block. And you're going to need that, because they made the enemies hyper-aggressive in this game. They don't leave you with a lot of openings to get your attacks in. Your throw moves in particular are real gambles, because if you don't grab and throw effectively instantaneously, then the enemy will counterattack you, knocking you back. On top of that, the stages tend to be a bit cramped. There are pits that will open up, and leave you with not much space for fighting. While you can block attacks, the timing for guarding is a little bit awkward, and a lot of things can go right through it. There also isn't a lot of health recovery in the game. You'll have to visit stores and buy medicine to get life back, and those are fairly rare as you progress. There are also difficulties with some of the bosses you'll encounter. Many of them can only be hurt with particular attacks, and it could take you a bit of effort to figure out what you need to do. And the mean cherry on top of all of this is that there's limited continues in the game. You do get passwords so that you can re-enter those and continue from where you like, but you're still going to have a tough time making any progress here. At least there's a two-player mode, so someone else can try to help you get through things. This one's pretty impossible, but at least it's more playable than the first game. The best thing I can say about Elnard is it's not the worst RPG on the Super Famicom. We've uh, already seen that game. It is, however, a pretty good contender for second place. If you're familiar with the US version of Elnard, called The Seventh Saga, then you might know it for its completely broken game mechanics and how it's virtually impossible to beat with some characters. The good news is, the US version broke some things in the translation. The bad news is, they're not that much more broken. At the outset of the game, you're given your choice of seven champions, and one of your goals in the game is to collect a set of mystic arcs. One of the gimmicks of the game is that you'll team up with other champions, while some of the remaining champions will become your foes, and will attack you at certain points of the game to try to steal your mystic arcs. The game is balanced around you having those, so if one gets stolen from you, then the difficulty skyrockets. And even if you are fully equipped, there are certain enemies that are likely to wipe you out if you encounter them, even once you're approaching max level. If you do encounter those enemies, well, you're in trouble because they made it extremely difficult to run away from combat. 
Elnard really is a game that wants to punish you for trying to play it. Another problem with the combat system is that you'll miss a lot. And because accuracy is tied to the speed stat, there are certain characters who can almost never hit anything. Of course, those characters have it better than the purely magic-using classes. A late-game dungeon disables all magical abilities, so if you had two spellcasters and get there, well, you're pretty much screwed. If the game wasn't being spiteful enough, the only place that you can save your progress is at inns. Now this might sound almost normal for an RPG, but keep in mind that most RPGs at this point give you some way to pick up right before a boss. They don't have that here, so if you confront a boss and get killed, you have to redo the entire dungeon. While I find a lot of these RPGs to only be difficult as a test of patience, Elnard is a game that just keeps kicking the player. You might be able to overcome things if you grind forever, but they're going to make you pay for that. Convenient Wars Barcode Battler Senki is a weird one. The Barcode Battler was a piece of hardware that allowed you to scan in barcodes from products, and it would convert those into numerical stats for fighters. Basically, you could use it to make your groceries fight each other. Epoch, the creator of the Barcode Battler, created a cable that would let you connect that separate electronic toy to the Super Famicom, and a surprising number of video games supported it. Usually you'd scan some kind of code, the UPC from the back of the box, for example, or a card that you received, and that would unlock some special thing in the game. Conveni Wars Barcode Battler Senki, on the other hand, is a full game based on that. The stats that you get from scanning in the barcodes are converted into monsters in this game. And you can play tactical battles against the computer using your monsters. The goal on every map is to take over your opponent's convenience store, a place where they can buy power-ups and items that they might need. And because the computer player is just going to park a unit on top of the store, it really means you have to wipe everybody out. Your units move in groups of two, and battles are resolved by each fighter doing a one-on-one -on -one combat with a member of the opposing team. Then the second characters do that, and if both sides have lost one unit at that point, then whoever's left standing finishes off the battle. Combat is pretty straightforward. You've got your attack, defend, run away, and also magic, because some units have that. But really, what it's going to come down to is did you find barcodes that had high enough stats to let you win the battle? Making things more difficult for you is how the game is a bit of a mess. There's a lot of equipment and items to use, but it's not really differentiated. On the battlefield, each side moves one unit at a time, trading back and forth, and it makes the game go really slow. And when you do get into a direct combat, it's not that interesting. It's just a numbers game. You're going to have to find some extra strong characters in order to beat the game, but when the game is this bad, it doesn't feel like you really should be putting the effort into doing that. I feel like the creators of Septentrion saw Prince of Persia and had one thought. This would be so much better if the entire game was an escort mission. The plot of the game is basically the Poseidon adventure. A luxury cruise liner is overturned by a large wave, and it's begun sinking. There's one hour before it goes to the bottom, and in that hour you'll have to find as many people on board the ship as you can and guide them safely to the exit, all while dealing with the fact that the ship is upside down and sometimes swinging wildly left to right. One of the big challenges in this game is the map. They modeled the entire cruise ship, right down to the hundred-some staterooms. And there aren't a lot of landmarks for these locations, which makes it hard to keep track of which doors lead someplace important and which ones will just put you in a room with nothing there. The size becomes an issue because of that hour time limit. Another strange factor in the game is that there's a scoring system. Septentrion has multiple endings, and which one you get depends on your score. Who you save matters as much as getting out. And as you'd expect for a sinking ship, it's women and children first. 
Unfortunately, escorting people is hard. Especially in the final segment where you have to do some very tricky platforming. You'll find that many characters just can't get around the environment. They'll get trapped on things and get hurt without your help. There are four different main characters that you can play as, and they change up both the story and how you have to approach certain people. Septentrion is one of those games that just has a ton of rough edges to it. The controls aren't as responsive as you'd like, escorting people is way too difficult, the scoring system is a bit obtuse, but it's also really distinctive. There aren't any other games like it, except the PlayStation Remake, which is a pretty bad version. This is a really difficult game, but it's one that shows a lot of creativity. Crayon Shinchan is one of those franchises that feels like it's going to go on forever. The television show debuted in 1992, it was instantly a huge hit, and it's still on the air today. The concept is Shinchan is a young child who has some very crude attitudes and gets into a lot of mean mischief. Crayon Shinchan Arashio Yobu Enji is one of the very first Crayon Shinchan games, though very, very far from the last. And it's a peculiar kind of beat em up. On every stage, you go around bothering various people, and eventually, if you bother the right person, they'll tell you that they want to get a certain item. And then you explore the stage until you find the card for that item, at which point you move on to the next stage. Various kids from the neighborhood will be wandering around outside, and if they come into contact with Shin-chan three times, then he curls up into a ball and you lose a life. Shin-chan has two methods of dealing with them. First, he can jump on their heads. This is generally the way you'll want to deal with them, but as you progress through the game it becomes more risky as the kids gain long-ranged attacks that will intercept you. It's still better than the other option, which is a somersault, it has almost a full second wind-up after you hit the button until Shin-chan actually performs the move. All of this is already difficult, but the true challenge of Crayon Shin-chan comes after certain stages when you have to beat a mini-game in order to progress. These mini-games tend to be random, giving you very little control over the outcome, and if you lose all of your lives while playing them, then you're thrown back a stage. Even the ones that aren't based on luck are still absurdly difficult. It seems like these minigames were how they intended to stretch out the gameplay here. This version of the game was so notoriously difficult that when it was reissued later on for the Mega Drive and the 3DS, it was modified to include an easy mode that simplified those minigames. I think if they had to make the game that much easier for other people, then this would definitely qualify as an impossible game. I think the pitch meeting for Act Razor 2 went something like this. You know how everybody loved the kingdom building portions of our previous game? And how they thought that the action stages were average at best? What if we strip out all the kingdom building and make it only action stages? And then we make the action stages so hard that people will claw their own eyes out. And that's where Act Razor 2 comes from. It's the kind of thing that I could easily see falling into a list of worst video game sequels ever, except the actual game quality for Act Razor 2 isn't that bad. Now admittedly, while I was recording, I couldn't get more than about 40 seconds into the stage, but that's because the game requires an absurd amount of precision, places enemies in really hard to avoid spots, and despite seemingly having a lengthy health bar, your life just melts away. Part of the reason why Act Razor 2 is so difficult is that it was made for an American market. And by this point, even Japanese developers were cranking up the difficulty for anything they intended to sell in the US. On top of that, they had one primary playtester, and they got to be way too good at the game, so they kept making it more difficult to challenge that person. There is an easy mode, but if you use it, you don't get to see the ending. One concession that they make to players is that you can choose to do the beginning stages in any order, but you will have to beat them all. So you could choose to get through ones that you find easier, or you could bang your head against the difficult ones. There's no character progression, it's not like you get weapons to help you take out the different bosses. 
so it really doesn't matter what order you choose to do the stages in. But beyond Act Razor 2's absurd difficulty, this is a very technical game, and it's well made. You can double jump into a glide and then cancel that to land where you want. You've got a shield that you can position, and a sword swing that goes in a few different directions. There's a lot more going on here than your traditional platformer. It's just also going to trip you and then kick you in the ribs a few times while you're on the ground moaning. Soko Kihei Votoms has the unfortunate reputation of being the other giant mech military sci-fi show. Once you've gotten through Gundam and Macross, then you go to Votoms. The plot of the game doesn't really tie into the plot of the series too much, beyond using the same setting. The plot of the game is about a kid whose family is killed by a mysterious group of mechs, and he follows their trail into a series of gladiatorial battles. The game is a third-person shooter, where every stage has you dropped into a square with some opponents, and then you try to maneuver around them, firing wildly until somebody's dead. If you're used to modern shooters, the clunkiness of the controls for Votoms is going to be a really steep learning curve. There's no strafing, your turning radius makes a school bus look nimble, and at least on the first stage, there isn't even any cover. Once your opponents have drawn a beat on you, it's really hard to get away, and the arena is just too small for you to try any fancy maneuvering. Another issue is that you're going to be fighting the same robots over and over again, and they have some very deep health pools. You have to pound on them for a long time before they finally go up. The result is combat that's extremely difficult to play, but also not very engaging. In these early stages, the only weapons that you have are your fists and a machine gun, and those aren't especially effective. There's only eight stages in the game, but because you're just doing the same thing over and over again, it still feels like that's too many levels. Soko Kihei Votoms is a game that looks really good from the outside. You might be watching this saying to yourself, wow, it actually looks kind of cool, but it is a miserable slog to play. Still, I can't dispute that it's very difficult. It's just maybe not a game I'd want to go out of my way to beat. Released on the same day as that Votoms game is this Macross game. So I guess it was a giant robot showdown. And in terms of quality, Macross wins, hands down. This is one of the more interesting shoot-em-ups on the Super Famicom. You get your choice of three characters, each of whom has a completely different weapon loadout. The mech that you're piloting transforms. It wouldn't be a Macross game without that, of course. And what weapon you're using changes depending on the form. All of this gives you a whole lot of options to deal with the invading aliens. If you stop firing, you'll even charge up a special move where you can capture enemy fighters and use them on your side. Even the stages are wildly inventive. You're seeing me play stage 1 here mainly because the first stage is extremely long, but there's so much going on during it. This is a game where you really don't know what's going to be thrown at you next, but whatever happens, it's going to be cool. The catch, of course, is that this is a shoot 'em up and that means the spectacle comes with a pretty steep difficulty curve. Macross throws you into the deep end. Right from the start, you're going to have to start memorizing the behaviors and patterns of the enemies to even stand a chance of getting through. Things are going to rush you from off screen, and the new obstacles that you encounter will be so different that you just won't know how to deal with them the first time. At least this is one of those shoot 'em ups that gives you a life bar. So it's not like you're just going to be flying along and suddenly explode because a shot came in from off screen. It'll be a shot, then a missile swarm, then a black hole bomb, then a rotating debris field, and you just won't have time to breathe. But all of that crazy stuff is what makes Macross such a cool game. Oh look, it's another Saga game. And just like the first Romancing Saga, this is an RPG whose mechanics are so obtuse that you really do need to play with a guide in front of you. In Romancing Saga 2, rather than earn experience points and level up, you have to fulfill certain conditions in order to get characters to learn new abilities. And these conditions are not always straightforward. 
One of the quirks of this system is that the more powerful of enemies that you're facing, the more likely it is that a character will be in to develop a new ability. And so it's actually worthwhile to throw yourself into desperate battles and see what shakes out. There's a lot more to Romancing Saga than that, of course, but digging into its myriad of unique RPG systems would have to be its own video. Even the plot of Romancing Saga 2 is radically different, as you play as a would-be emperor conquering the world, and you have to defeat seven heroes who are getting in your way. And there's even multiple routes through the game, as how you choose to handle scenarios determines how the plot of the game plays out. Unfortunately, all of these systems are really difficult to understand, particularly how they all interact with each other. And as I said, you pretty much have to play with a guide in front of you if you're going to make any progress. Even the developers didn't seem to really understand all of the systems, because a lot of them are severely bugged. Romancing Saga 2's list of critical game bugs that you'll encounter is almost as long as the list of weird features that they packed into the game. And all of this actually makes getting started in the game extremely difficult. Until you've gotten lucky and been able to develop your character a little bit, you're going to get kicked around. And that's another reason to have the guide in front of you, except the guide won't be able to save you there. But there's one more thing about Romancing Saga 2 that truly earns it its place on the list of impossible games that you'd want to beat before you die. And that's because it has pretty much the hardest final boss of any RPG ever made. In fact, you've been watching me fight it with a maxed out party, and I'm still going to get trashed. Pretty much the only way to beat it is to cheat. You have to use some real broken techniques in order to get through this battle. On the other hand, if you can beat Romancing Saga 2, then you've really earned some bragging rights. It really feels like we're in the shooter portion of the list, doesn't it? And we're getting some good shoot 'em ups. R Type 3 is a huge step up from the previous Super R Type that we saw. Now you have your choice of three different weapon loadouts. They'll give you a different pod with slightly different behaviors and give you a different set of weapon progressions. The stages are enormously improved as well. It's not like the levels in Super R Type were bad, it's just they felt very 1988 while well, R-Type 3 really updates the design sensibility. The stages are more dynamic, with obstacles that are shifting and spinning around you, and the slowdown that plagued Super R-Type is all but gone. But even though it's been improved, R-Type 3 still has a lot of the R-Type difficulty. Checkpoints are rare, so a death will send you way back, and there's tons of things that will just kill you the first time that you encounter them. This is a game that really relies on you memorizing the stages and the obstacles that you're going to face. On the fourth stage in particular, there's a maze that will be fatal to you a lot of the time, because there's so many dead ends. It also increases the difficulty as you play. Enemy patterns will change based on how long you've been playing for, and how powered up your ship is. They don't even have the excuse of being an arcade game trying to suck down quarters for this one. R-Type 3 was made for the Super Famicom. Hiram just likes their shooters to be mean. Hey, we've reached the halfway point of this list. 50 games down, 50 to go. And we've been at this quite a while. So this is a good point to stop for a bit, take a break, refresh your drink, use the restroom, take care of whatever you've been dodging by watching YouTube videos, it's okay, this video will still be here when you get back. In the meantime, once again I'm going to take some very brief looks at Game Boy games that tie back to some of these impossible games. The first Hokuto no Ken fighting game wasn't Hokuto no Ken 6, it was Seizan Juban Shobu for the Game Boy. Of course, since that game predated Street Fighter 2 by over two years, the fighting game mechanics are really rough. Most people aren't going to have a whole lot of fun with it. Something a little bit more exciting is the Game Boy port of Parodius Da. One of the interesting things about the Parodius ports is that they often put their own unique spin on the game. While you can see the reflections of the original Parodius Da in the Game Boy version, it's also been scaled down. 
basically reworking it to something that plays pretty well on the go. All the big moments from Parodius are here. They're just shrunk down a lot. Everyone's favorite punk Kunio got several outings on the Game Boy, though none that really match his action RPG on the Super Famicom. In the case of Naketsu Ko Kunio Kun, the sprites in the game were completely replaced and it was turned into Double Dragon 2 for the US market. But since Double Dragon is a spin-off of the Kunio games anyways, it's not like they had to take it very far for that. Othello World was actually the second Othello game for the Game Boy. While the AI is competent, it doesn't approach the skill of the AI on the Super Famicom version. And you're not claiming tiers of opponents, you just select who you want to play against at the beginning. But it does have this super snazzy Super Game Boy Paladin frame. And if you wanted to play Dortamon on the go, there are actually several Dortamon games on the Game Boy at this point. Dortamon Taiketsu Himitsu Dogu was the first, and it's really not like the one that we've seen so far. It alternates between overhead action and side-scrolling action, and it's a kind of bland game, honestly. The kind of thing that you could just sell as generic game, and then put any character you like into it. And that's enough Game Boy for right now. We'll pick this back up after another 25 impossible Super Famicom games. Didn't we just see Dortamon on this list? Well, there's a lot of Dortamon games out there. Dortamon 2 Nobita no Toys Land Daiboken uses almost the exact same formula as the first game. In this case, there's an army of rampaging toys that you have to take out. And that means clearing a bunch of side-scrolling levels interconnected with some exploration in a Dragon Quest-style map. There are two significant changes for this game. When you begin a stage, you have the opportunity to choose one of six characters, Dordoman, Nobita, or any of his friends, and they all behave a little bit differently from each other. Not enough where you could really tell a significant difference, but there is some small changes between how quickly they move and how high they jump. The other thing is that you have an arsenal of toy-based weaponry to cycle through. There are a few things that make the game I'm not going to say difficult, because it really isn't that difficult, but more annoying to complete. The bosses are enormous damage sponges, requiring a ton of hits, and you really don't get any feedback that you're doing anything to them. You'll have to pound on them for a long time before they finally go down. Also, there's no checkpoints on any of the stages, so if you die at any point, including the boss, then you have to start over. There are a few stages that are notable for tricky jumping and the possibility of an instant death, but I personally don't find it to be especially difficult. In fact, I think it might be the easiest game on this list. Definitely not something I'd flag as an impossible game. I feel like Super Gojira is a game designed to hurt people. In fact, I'd rather play the rival Giant Monster Gamera's game on the Super Famicom. And that game's awful. The concept is that aliens are directing giant monsters to attack the Earth, and so some scientists have put a mind control device on Godzilla, and are driving him around cities, smashing through buildings until they reach the rival giant monster. Then Godzilla engages with it in one-on-one -on -one battle. There are two game modes here, neither of which work. First, you have an overhead map where you very slowly walk Godzilla around the city. There are some points of interest, like tanks under alien control that you want to smash through, and nuclear power plants where Godzilla can recover health. But for the most part, it's look at the small map, push a direction, watch Godzilla very slowly make his way into that next square, and then repeat. It's less exciting than the human parts of a Godzilla movie. Once you make your way to the other monster, it becomes a fighting game style battle. The movement here is very stiff, and the controls are terrible. To do anything, you have to start a combo on the monster, but most of them can just shove Godzilla all the way to the opposite side of the screen. It's incredibly frustrating to do anything in this game. Making matters worse, this is only the first stage that you're seeing. Violante is the boss of the third stage, and that monster is virtually unbeatable. 
It's a strange mix where you go from the trivial and not very interesting overhead map sections, and then go into the absurdly difficult fighting game sections. This is one of those games where you absolutely have to read the manual as well. It will just be impenetrable if you don't. Super Gojira is a game that's incredibly unfair and unfun, but at least it has some familiar giant monsters in it. Yu Yu Hakusho is a game that's weirdly similar to the previous one on this list. It's also a much better game, and that's because they actually put some effort into it. This is a one-on-one -on -one fighting game with a lengthy story mode, though you might not be able to tell it's a fighting game just from the images. Characters get their own big standout action portraits that are always separate from each other. The challenge in playing Yu Yu Hakusho is that the control scheme is non-standard. I think it actually becomes intuitive after you've played it a bit, but it's the kind of thing that will take a while to master. The simple version is you have to hold down a button and watch a gauge build up. That button, plus the direction that you're pressing, determines what action you'll take. And then you'll watch animations of you and your opponent doing their thing, with the result being determined by how those actions interact and how long each of you charged up. The first player to move will have the advantage of charging faster, but the second player will see what they're doing and can pick an appropriate counter move. That kind of makes this a fighting game for people who aren't very good at fighting games. The strategies, at least, are a lot more accessible for players. An additional twist of the game is that the length of the bar represents how likely your action is to succeed, and that chance is never 100%. There's also a bit of luck in how spiritual power is distributed. It builds up between turns and determines how effective your special attacks will be. The game has a lot of randomness that gives people a lot of trouble. The thing that makes Yu Yu Hakusho notably difficult is that near vertical learning curve. You are going to have trouble playing this game at first. Hopefully you can learn enough that you can reliably do some damage. The Gunbar and Goemon series are some of my favorite games on the Super Famicom. I enjoy the huge mix of play styles, going from side-scrolling action to exploring areas with beat-em-up style movement, the many mini-games, and even the giant robot action. Gunbar and Goemon 2 is the entry in the series where everything really came together. The next several entries are going to be basically more of this, and I was good with that. The plot of this Goemon game is that Edo Castle has been turned into a flying fortress by an invading Scotsman. Goemon and his usual partner, Ebetsu, are joined by a robotic ninja as a new companion, and they'll have to traverse all of Japan in their quest to stop him. A strange thing about the selection of Ganbare Goemon 2 for this list is that it's the easiest of the Super Famicom Goemon games. The only thing that stands out here as especially difficult are some of the stages, and even then, I wouldn't rate them as very difficult compared to other games in the series. It's also the shortest Goemon game on the Super Famicom. I wouldn't say that there's no challenge at all here, but on the scale of impossible games, this one's pretty low. On the other hand, it is an amazing game to play. The action's always a ton of fun, even if you're not playing co-op with someone else. Konami put a lot of creativity into the Ganbare Goemon series, and none of the Super Famicom ones are bad. In fact, I'd say all of the Gunbari Golmon games on the Super Famicom are extremely good. It's just that this one isn't as hard as the others. Good news! Hokuto no Ken 7 is the last game in the series. Not the last Hokuto no Ken game at all, unfortunately. It's just the last one that we're going to be seeing on this list. And if you thought they might have learned something from the previous truly awful fighting game they made, the answer to that is no, they haven't learned a single thing. You can just look at the nearly animationless sprites, and the bland, uninteresting action, and know that this is a bad fighting game. But it's even worse to play. For one thing, the special moves don't work. Okay, technically they can work. It's just, even if you know the inputs to do, you won't be able to pull them off. And the reason for that is you have to have a short delay between every input. 
So if you're familiar with a fireball motion from other fighting games, picture having to push in one of those directions, release and wait about a quarter second, then press in the next direction, release and wait for a quarter second, and so on. Adding to the fun of that is you have to use one of those special moves in order to defeat opponents. And naturally, the difficulty is completely absurd. If you manage to connect to an opponent, you'll do next to no damage. Even if you manage to get past the first opponent in story mode, the second opponent just spams unblockable super moves. Imagine playing against that guy at your arcade who only knew one special move and did it over and over and over again. Except you can't block that special move, and it's almost a guaranteed hit. This game is so bad, I don't even know if it's better than Hokuto no Ken 6. They're both below F-tier fighting games. Fighting games that you'd only play if you wanted to inflict them on someone. This game is so bad that they basically stopped making Hokuto no Ken games. It would be basically 10 years before they really began making them again. That's quite a legacy for an impossible game. We're hitting the RPG section of the list. There's a lot of them coming up immediately. Monster Maker 3 is obviously the third game in the Monster Maker series, and they were based on a pen and paper game. It's also an enormous departure from the previous Monster Maker games, which had more of a board game quality to them. This is more of a straightforward Dragon Quest clone. Though the combat system is distinctive in how the position of characters matters. They'll move around the field doing their best to obey your commands, but sometimes they just can't move far enough, and sometimes the position will help them. The big thing that flags Monster Maker 3 as an impossible game is the absurd encounter rate, which feels like the standard complaint for every RPG at the time. It's not uncommon to go two or three steps and then have another fight. Monster Maker 3 is also notable for being rather buggy, though some of the bugs work in the player's favor, like becoming intangible to walls if you hit the wrong button after you cast a particular spell. At the time of its release, Monster Maker 3 was also notable for being rather obscure with conditions for a lot of things, which made players struggle to find paths through the game. These days you can just read a walkthrough, of course, but at the time, the strategy guides that were released, all three of them, were filled with misinformation. Monster Maker 3 was intended to be part of a pair of games, one for the Super Famicom and one for the PC Engine CD, and as rough as the original Super Famicom game is, the PC Engine game that was released just a few months later is regarded as one of the worst, buggiest games on the system. So Super Famicom fans got lucky in that situation. These days, Monster Maker 3 has a bit of a mixed reputation. It's a tough RPG to finish, but mainly because it requires a lot of patience for the battles. And RPG fans who can put up with that seem to like it quite a bit. The Momotaro Densetsu line of RPGs started out on the Famicom. In fact, it was one of the very first games to follow in the wake of Dragon Quest. The series uses a light-hearted take on Japanese folklore, retelling the story of Momotaru, a boy found in a peach, who then goes off and fights a bunch of demons. Shin Momotaro Densetsu was intended as a remake of the PC Engine Momotaro Densetsu 2, which was the sequel to the PC Engine remake of that original Momotaro Densetsu. But in the process of adapting between the platforms, a lot of the content of the game was changed, and so, while well, technically this is a sequel to the Famicom game, it also isn't really. Fans of the series wind up arguing quite a bit about how it all fits together. While the plotline is nominally about a kidnapped princess that you're trying to rescue, the plot actually has its roots in conflicts between two different sects of Buddhist philosophy. There's a phrase I never thought I'd say. Of course, this is another game where the encounter rate is super high, it is very likely for you to move one step and then get into another fight immediately. And the game has balanced your income around that high encounter rate, meaning that if you try to avoid fighting constantly, you're going to wind up behind on the money curve. The cartridges for Shin Momotaro Densetsu are also a bit infamous for losing their save games. If you do play it on a real cartridge, be sure you hold down reset before you turn off power. 
Team Momotaro Densetsu is one of the more popular RPGs on the Super Famicom, and it's still well regarded to this day. But I think it has the same problem that a lot of these RPGs have when we consider them for difficulty, which is why they're included on this list. Most of the game can just be overcome with patience. There are a few puzzles that will require some knowledge and ability to get through, but as long as you can put up with the game long enough, you can get to the ending. So I noticed an issue with what I hope is the editing that started around this point. The book rates Sailor Moon R as one star for quality. And this is not a stinker by any stretch. I don't think I'd put it at the top of my Super Famicom rankings, but it's a pretty respectable beat-em-up that has a huge cast of characters, all with distinctive moves, a pretty good variety of enemies, and just enough challenge to keep you coming back. And since Arc System Works developed it, it also happens to have some pretty decent animation. Even in Japan, it's a pretty well-regarded Super Famicom game. So why does this book give it one star for quality? The only thing that the book even hints might be a reason is that some characters are just better than others. And if you choose one of those easy characters, then you won't have any trouble clearing the game. But that doesn't really feel like a reason to put it at the absolute nadir of Super Famicom stuff. We'll see another game in a couple of entries where the one star rating is even worse. And that's making me suspect that there might be some poor editing at work here. Sailor Moon R is a straightforward beat em up to play. You only have one attack button, a jump button, and a super move. But there are a variety of attacks that come out of that. There's a fighting game mode as well in it, and I think that the character balance is more of a problem with that than it is with the story mode. Sailor Moon R has a reputation as an especially easy game, even if you don't use one of the characters that trivialize everything. It makes me wonder if the author of the book might have been thinking of a different Sailor Moon game on the system. There certainly are a lot of them. That said, I think it's an enjoyable game. By all means, play it. If you wanted to own it, you can find boxed copies for about a thousand yen. It's just, I wouldn't consider it to be an impossible game that I'd like to beat before I die. Have you not had your fill of Ultraman, Gundam, and Kamen Rider crossover games yet? What if instead of doing a top-down shooter, beat-em-up, soccer game, dodgeball game, baseball game, or another dodgeball game with them, they had an RPG? And this RPG is regarded as a real train wreck. Just about the worst RPG on the Super Famicom. So, you know, living up to the high standards of a Bon Presto game. The plot is a mashup of all three franchises, and honestly doesn't make any bit of sense anyways. It's basically all of the bad guys do their bad guy things. The thing that makes Gaia Saver stand out is the terrible combat system. At the start of every turn, you can choose to just hit the attack button, and that's sufficient to have everybody do a move on some enemy. But move is randomly selected, though for many of them there isn't a significant difference between the moves. The exception to that are special abilities, which consume a bit of MP for the character. You can give every character orders directly, picking out exactly what they'll do and who they'll target, but this is another one of those RPGs with an absolutely overwhelming number of random encounters, so you'll probably want to rely on the auto battle anyways. You fully restore your health after every fight, but restoring MP requires using an item or going to certain special locations. And that means that the auto combat is going to make you run out of that vital resource a lot. There's also a game where you'll encounter a lot of enemies that are specially spongy, take a ton of hits to defeat, and you'll be working on them for a while. Fortunately for you, there are some moves and items that are just overwhelmingly powerful. And once you have those and know to use them, then the game becomes trivialized. It's just tedious. And of course, the game has a lot of locations that look identical, and while you might know your next destination, you won't know where it is. Which means you're going to be spending a lot of time wandering identical-looking locations, hoping to find the right place. Gaia Saver is another situation where, as an RPG, it's not especially difficult. 
Just something that will grind you down until you wish you had stopped. The thing that makes this one impossible is that you're not going to want to play it very long. It's 1994, and we're already getting Megami Tensei spin-offs. Majin Tensei kicks off a whole new sub-series for the giant, sprawling franchise. This time, they're taking on strategy RPGs. The Megami Tensei series are known for being especially difficult RPGs, ones that don't hold your hand, give the player a ton of options, and let them dig some very deep holes for themselves. And all of that occurs in Majin Tensei. The concept of the game is that a boy living in apocalyptic Tokyo, because there's always an apocalyptic Tokyo in Megami Tensei games, he receives a program that will let him summon demons. And he proceeds to use that program to recruit allies, and proceeds to fight a series of strategic battles against the armies of demons that are roaming the world. In battle, you've got to juggle recruitment, collect enough resources that you can afford to keep bringing out more demons, watch the timings on your summoning so that they coincide with the most opportune moments, and balance your forces as you fight your way through the scenarios. If you do find yourself struggling with a scenario, it is possible to go back and replay earlier ones. So it's difficult to get truly stuck, but you could find yourself in a situation where you'll have to go backwards for quite a while in order to build up enough to continue. The unit balance isn't great in Majin Tensei, and in this case it's not a situation where some of them are overpowered, it's a situation where some of them wind up being especially weak. Which again means that if you build your forces wrong, you could find yourself in some deep trouble. This is also a game where getting the best ending requires a lot more effort than many players might be willing to put in. You'll have to do extensive side quests and fulfill requirements that aren't always clear. So even if you beat this one, you might not consider it completely clear unless you do a lot more work. Olivia's Mystery is one of the strangest games on the Super Famicom. It is a narrative, animated jigsaw puzzle game. You get a long block of story text, and then you have to solve a jigsaw puzzle where the picture is animated. You don't have any idea of what the picture would look like beforehand. The puzzles are not easy to solve. You're not given a picture of what it looks like, so even when you start making out shapes from the mess, you don't know where they fit in the frame. On top of that, pieces can be mirrored horizontally and vertically, so you still have to work out the correct orientation for everything. The story block will give you some hints on what you're supposed to be doing, but not that much of a hint. Another complication is that some pieces are duplicated. These duplicates will be fake pieces that if you put into the puzzle, will pop out. There's 18 puzzles that you'll have to play through like this, and the timer in the upper right hand corner is continuous for the whole game. That becomes important because there are three different endings to Olivia's mystery, and your final puzzle is dependent upon how long it took you to get there. It's challenging just to get to the bad ending. Getting to the good ending is a real accomplishment. Olivia's Mystery was going to be part of an entire line of puzzle games like this, but they only made one more of them before stopping. This one's a more creative brain teaser than you might expect from the idea of a jigsaw puzzle video game. Particularly since most of the puzzles are designed to be disorientating. This one's an interesting game that's harder than it looks. Kido Senshi V Gundam is one of those games that's less challenging and more just unpleasant to play. It follows the plot of the television show, or at least part of the television show since it wasn't finished airing at the time of the game's release. The concept is you have to take on a set of enemy mobile suits in short action scenes. You're in an arena, and enemies will just drop in on you. Once you've beaten enough of them, you're allowed to go on to the next stage. The first thing you're going to notice as you play is that the V Gundam is about the least maneuverable, least responsive machine that you could possibly drive. It can't even jump. What it can do is put up a shield, swing a beam saber, fire tiny machine guns from its head, 
use a big rifle, which is the only way to attack enemies above you, and perform a very short dash. The enemy AI tends to stand far back from you and play keep away, chewing you to pieces, stunning you, and then backing up. Since the rifle has limited ammunition, you're probably going to run out before you manage to take out all of the enemies on a stage. Players came up with an easy solution for that. If you crouch in a corner and put up your shield, then they can't hurt you either. Which means you can almost always win a battle, just very, very, very slowly. Hito Senshi V Gundam is also one of those games where you have to beat it on hard difficulty in order to get the ending. And if you didn't think the game looked and played cheap enough on its own, all of the sound effects were reused from an SD Gundam game that Tosei and Bandai had already made. I don't have two minds on whether or not this is a valid, impossible game. If you try to play it straight and get the best ending, it is annoyingly difficult and you will be beating your head against the wall. On the other hand, if you use the cheesy tactics, it's beatable, you're just going to be putting yourself to sleep as you do it. In the end, I guess this is a game where very few people would have ever seen the ending. Shin Megami Tensei 2 is a cursed game. And I'm not speaking figuratively here. As the fan lore goes, at the outset of every Megami Tensei project, the head of the team visits a particular shrine. They did not do this for Shin Megami Tensei 2, and as a result, the game is cursed. That's why the game is riddled with so many bugs, some of them potentially destroying your progress and forcing you to start over. Yep, the bugs are definitely the result of a curse by a vengeful spirit, rather than an overworked team stretched thin by a huge number of projects. The plot of Shin Megami Tensei 2 is, is the common one for the Megami Tensei games. Tokyo's been destroyed, and now demons wander the world. The player is a human who has the ability to manage those demons, and so you'll have to both fight and recruit them to make your way through the game until you finally kill God. The Megami Tensei games are already relatively difficult RPGs, since they tend to have more tactical considerations than most other games in the genre. In particular for this one, when you create new demons by fusing two together, a standard for the series, your new demon will inherit pro your new demon will inherit abilities from one of its parents. That will carry forward in other Megami Tensei games, and it means that you have to think about how you're developing your party. This is also one of the monster RPGs for the Super Famicom, longer than most of them, and in this case, it's not because it requires a massive amount of grinding. There's a long, epic story involved here. But enough of that, let's talk about the bugs. The most infamous of these was a bug that struck if you summoned more than seven times in combat. This may sound like it's a rare thing to occur, because how often do you need to bring out new party members in the middle of combat? But summoning is how you deal with one of your demons getting killed and there are a lot of instant death attacks in this game. Against some bosses, you are going to have to summon a few times. When you summon the eighth time in combat, you corrupt the game's memory, and then anything can happen. Maybe you'll get lucky and all your stats will suddenly become the maximum. Or maybe it'll scramble your save file. That's not even the only memory corruption bug that you could easily stumble across. If a spell is reflected back at a party member that doesn't exist, memory corruption. There's a spell that you can use to temporarily summon other demons that appears to have the wrong memory offset, and so will load up all sorts of crazy things, and plenty of bugs that will just freeze the game when they occur. There's also overflow bugs that are likely to affect your stats, spells that have the opposite effect to what they're supposed to do, and a strange bug that just throws money at you. This version of Shin Megami Tensei 2 really does earn the designation of an impossible game, because if you can make it through all those bugs and kill Yahweh, it's a miracle. Please direct all complaints to My Way Publishing, 1-2-5 Kanda Jinbosha Waguri Hatoya Building, 3rd Floor, Shiyoraku, Tokyo, 
1010051. They're the ones who think that Super Metroid is a one-star game, not me. I'd never say that someone has to love Super Metroid, though if they didn't I'd look at them weird. It's just that Super Metroid is a cornerstone game. It stands alongside things like Space Invaders, Dragon Quest, and Doom, where so many games that followed it built directly on what it did. One of those games where if you want to understand why games are what they are, then you need to understand it. And even if you don't like playing Super Metroid, all of that is worth way more than one star. The concept behind Super Metroid should be familiar to anyone who'd watch this video. I mean, it literally contributed its title to a genre. Space bounty hunter Samus Aran doesn't go around collecting bounties, she hunts Metroids, energy-sucking jellyfish. And this adventure takes her back to a planet where she first encountered them. She starts with only the ability to jump and shoot, but as you explore the maze-like caverns of the planet, you discover power-ups for her that will grant her new movement, additional weaponry, and unlock further paths. Now, I'm not going to say that Super Metroid's a perfect game. The default control scheme is a nightmare, for example. And the wall jump technique that you're required to use at one point in the map is very poorly explained. It's hard to find fault with it otherwise. Well, there is one other area, and that's how Super Metroid isn't especially difficult. My very first playthrough took about six hours, which when you consider how large and sprawling the game is, six hours is relatively quick. It's not that I think that Super Metroid's too easy, it's just the same point that I keep returning to, where it's on a list of games that are supposed to be super difficult. Maybe Super Metroid leans more to the I want to beat side of things than the impossible game side. Because it's definitely one that anyone who likes video games should want to beat. Kigirumi Daiboken is an odd game. The Kigirumi of the title are basically mascot costumes of the type that are popular in Japan. Your characters wear the costumes and their abilities change according to what they're wearing. The plot of the game is that you're two kids who get sucked into a dream world and have to save it from some evil bad guys. And the dream world consists of a big first-person maze in the style of wizardry. Or I guess Shin Megami Tensei, since we just saw that. Kigurumi Daiboken has a really poor reputation in Japan, and that's because the game is very confusing and barely uses the systems that are provided. For example, there's a tailor who can combine costumes, but it's hard to get to them, and the costumes that you get from enemies are more than sufficient. The combat system is very slightly action-based, where the enemies will dance around on the screen, and you have to choose to attack at just the right moment, otherwise you won't hit them. It looks and feels a bit like the game was designed for children, but the maze is absurdly complicated, requiring doubling back and going up and down floors. If you're making your own map, you might want to use transparencies, since vertical movement matters a lot in this game. One of the more annoying things in the game is that the run command is broken. You can almost never run away from battles, so players are forced to sit through the exceptionally slow combat system. This is another one of those RPGs on this list where the primary difficulty comes from how it tries your patience. I'm trying to think if Super Bomberman 2 is the peak of the Bomberman series. I don't think it is when it comes to multiplayer, and that's the big reason to play Bomberman games. But when we're talking about impossible games here, we're looking at the single player mode. And is Super Bomberman 2 the best of them? The plot of the game doesn't matter. There's an evil guy doing evil things on Bomberman World, and Bomberman decides to go bomb him. There, done. Let's get on with blowing stuff up. Super Bomberman 2 sets the pattern that the rest of the Super Bomberman series will follow. All of the games follow the same general rules. You drop bombs that explode after a few seconds, blowing up blocks will uncover power-ups that make your bombs better, blow up all the enemies on the stage, and then go through the exit door to get to the next level. However, Super Bomberman 1 was relatively primitive in comparison to Super Bomberman 2. 
This is where they really started throwing in all of their ideas for how to improve the game. You've got elaborate scrolling layouts that are much larger than the stages in the original game, things on the playfield that affect how your bombs act, and opening the exit door isn't as simple as uncovering it and blowing up all the enemies. I think the reason that Super Bomberman 2 was chosen for this book is that opening that door after you defeat all the enemies is sometimes not straightforward. The first Super Bomberman was basically a slightly better version of the 8-bit Bomberman games. While Super Bomberman 2, and by extension the rest of the series on the Super Famicom, take that concept and push it in new directions. Now all of that said, I'd probably go with one of the PC Engine Bombermans as the best multiplayer one, and one of the later Super Bomberman games as the best single-player Bomberman, and I don't even know which one I'd consider to be the most difficult. Bomberman's always a game where you're far more dangerous to yourself than the enemies are to you. This is a game that can be mean, but really you're going to be cursing yourself when you die. We've hit the section of the list that has all of these surprise western releases that came 30 years after the original Japanese. Shin Niketsu Koha Kuniotachi no Banka has a relatively recent re-release as River City Girls Zero because the recent revival of the Kunio series as River City Girls is a long-after sequel to this game. This would be the last Kunio beat-em-up that Technos Japan would work on before they suddenly went bankrupt. And as appropriate for such a trailblazer, Shin Niketsu Koha was way ahead of its time. It's basically a modern character action game. There are long cutscenes to introduce what's happening, and then you fight a brawl in some unusual location. And once you've cleared out those enemies and maybe fought a boss, you get another long cutscene. The storyline is that Kunio's arrested for a crime he didn't commit. One of the few he didn't commit, I guess. And then he busts out of prison to go find the real perpetrator. As you might guess since this was re-released as River City Girls, Kunio teams up with allies, including some women, and you can swap between characters freely. Each of them has their own life bar, and the game's difficulty is set up to take advantage of that. You only refill your health when you complete a stage. And since you can effectively have four life bars, even the small fries that you fight have special moves that do extreme damage. Technos did provide an easy mode for the game, but it's one of those situations where the game ends halfway through and tells you to play on a harder difficulty. Another challenge in the fighting system is that you're really dependent on your own special attacks. Your standard punches and kicks effectively do nothing, so you have to learn everybody's full set of moves in order to be effective during a brawl. Shin Niketsu Koha is a very difficult brawler. If you try to beat this one, you're going to get your teeth punched in a lot. At least they give you regular passwords as you progress. It's still a tough one to complete, though. As I've been progressing through the book, I've been playing a lot of really bad fighting games. So imagine my surprise when I played one that's actually good. And I hadn't really played World Heroes 2 before, because I hated the first World Heroes. Why would I give the second one a chance? Now in fairness, fighting game fans have a lot of problems with this one. But still, this is a breath of fresh air for me. In the footage here, I'm playing in deathmatch mode. A gameplay style where both characters share one health bar, and the stage arenas are often filled with hazards. Things like landmines, or beams that shoot down from the sky, or rushing water that pushes you around. For the most part, fighting your way up the ladder of opponents isn't too bad. The real challenge kicks in once you reach the final boss, who is an input-reading, ultra-damaging, cheating monster. One thing that the player has working in their advantage there is that all of the characters have an infinite combo. So if you can get it started, you're guaranteed a victory. But it's still probably not something that you'd actually want to use with friends. It also has one of the common problems with classic fighting games, where many characters have certain moves that are just outright overpowered. Techniques where there's just not effective counters to them. Those are the kinds of flaws that I think really only show up when you're playing World Heroes 2 at a high level. For just grabbing a fighting game to play with some friends, this one's not a bad choice. 
as an impossible game, well, the only thing that really makes it impossible is something that has in common with a lot of fighting games of the era. A final boss that's so cheesy he could be put on pizza. It doesn't make for a very fun challenge when you easily climb up the ladder and then have to wait until random chance lets you beat the final boss. But it is super difficult. And here's the other game that got a western release 30 years after it was originally released in Japan. Live Alive is widely considered to be one of Square's masterpiece RPGs. A game that takes the rules of the genre and breaks them heavily. The concept behind Live Alive is that it's not just a single RPG, it's a set of several small RPGs, and once you clear all of them, there is one final scenario that brings the stories together. And the scenarios are all widely different from each other. One of them takes in the Paleolithic, with where there's no use of language. Another scenario takes place in modern day, where a martial artist just fights the strongest people that he can find. No equipment, no leveling, just fighting. And in contrast to that, there's a scenario where you're playing as a robot in the far future who almost never engages in combat. Now as an impossible game, this one's a bit of a weird choice. Even the combat-heavy scenarios aren't especially difficult. This is a game that's almost entirely story-driven. The game mechanics are changed to fit the tone of the story that they're telling. But that story's really all you're focused on. There are some scenarios that people consider to be more difficult. The scenario that's selected by default where you play as a ninja is often pointed to as the hardest one. It's still not very difficult. As you might expect for a Square game of this era, there are tons of bugs. But the worst of them aren't things that you'd really encounter in regular play. It's possible to save your game's progress at a point where it'd be very difficult to continue. Or in the one scenario where you're building characters to your specifications, it's possible to make them so poorly that they can't do anything. You're just not going to really run into these situations, though. Live Alive is an excellent game, an influential game, but not an impossible game. Kirby Bowl is a game that's trying to lure you in with a cute facade, and then stab you hard as you're trying to beat it. It's a game that will tell you it's a golf game. Look, even though it's Kirby, you're still taking strokes and trying to get him into the hole. But it's not a golf game. Not really. It's a puzzle game designed around golf. And it's one of the most monstrously difficult and cruel puzzle games on the Super Famicom. Your goal on every stage in Kirby Bowl is to shoot Kirby through all of the monsters. This knocks them out, and when there's only one left, that last monster becomes the hole that Kirby has to get into. When you start out, Kirby has four shots that you can take before he loses a life. These are represented by tomatoes, and you get one tomato back when you defeat an enemy, and one tomato back when Kirby drops into that hole. If you're not succeeding in doing something with every single shot, you're losing ground in this game. There are eight courses with eight holes each on them. The game starts out kind of tricky, and by the end it is nigh impossible. Technically, you can get a hole-in-one on any single hole, but good luck figuring out how to do it on most of these. Kirby can get special abilities from some of the enemies he defeats, and those will help you make some of the trickier shots. You still have to know how to use them at just the right moment, though. This is one of those games where if you're not familiar with it, you look at Kirby Wool and you go, well, how hard could it be? I'm not joking around. It is very difficult. If I was making my own list of the hardest Super Famicom games instead of just following along in a book, Kirby Bowl would stand a good shot of making the list for being both playable and effectively impossible to beat. Oh yeah, Demon's Blazin'. One of the top three Super Famicom games whose title gives you a very different impression of what the game will be about. This is the third game in the Red Arimer series, which itself was a spin-off of Makaimura, or Ghost and Goblins. The games put you into the shoes of the Red Arimer, or Talons, I guess. The monster that you always hated to see in Makaimura. Flapping around, just out of reach, mocking you, and then destroying the hapless player who comes along. 
In this adventure, the Red Eyed Dreamer is searching the demon world, looking for a monster that stole magic stones. The stones grant the ability to transform oneself and use super abilities, so naturally you're going to take advantage of those when you get them. The Super Famicom game plays fairly similarly to the first two games in the series, which were on the Game Boy and Famicom respectively. You can hover, cling to walls, breathe fire, and once you're past this first stage, there's a whole world to explore, along with power-ups that will let you access new areas. The game is moderately difficult, at least until the end boss. That final opponent is one of the most difficult bosses on the Super Famicom. A brick wall of difficulty that stops just about everyone in their tracks. Without him, the game still might have made a list of 100 impossible Super Famicom games, but with that boss, its place was guaranteed. There are also multiple endings to the game. It's possible to take on the villain of the story without recovering all of the stones. But if you do get all of the stones and beat him, that's how you unlock the true final boss that will kick your teeth in. Demon's Blazon is an amazing game, one of the high points of the 16-bit era, and I think it makes a pretty good challenge. Shin Megami Tensei If is the game that set off the dominoes. The game is a spin-off of the Megami Tensei series, that takes the demon summoning and merging and party management and moved it away from the hellish dungeons and ruins of Tokyo to a new setting, high school. And if that sounds familiar to you, it might be because the team immediately started working on PlayStation 1 follow-up that went by the title Persona. The plot of the game is that in the middle of a school day, an entire high school was drawn into another world. Now it's up to the player and his school friends to get to the bottom of what happened. And if they can keep their head when all about them are losing theirs and blaming it on them, they might just be able to do it. If is built on the Shin Megami Tensei 2 engine. In fact, it was going to be an extra difficult version of that game, and then they decided to rework things. It was made on a very short development schedule, which resulted in it being a bit of a small game, but not an easy one. A lot of the same systems for handling your demon companions came forward from that game. But a new addition is Possession. When your character falls in battle, you become possessed by your guardian demon. There is no game over here. The character can be revived and the possession goes away. But you actually want to die in some cases so that you can build up that guardian demon's abilities. The systems for handling that, as well as the relationships between your classmates, isn't especially transparent here. That's part of what makes IF so difficult. On the positive side of things, a lot of the bugs that plagued Shin Megami Tensei 2 have been resolved, though not all of them. The biggest one that remains is that you can choose to auto-battle and there's no way to exit it. And in some cases, thanks to various immunities, you can't harm the enemy and the enemy can't harm you. Another issue with the game is that the early game balance is, um, really rough. You will be defeated a lot in battle as you start out. You can't die, it's not really setting you back, you just also can't make any progress. Shin Megami Tensei If is a game that promises you an easier time than most of the Megami Tensei games, and then it stabs you pretty hard for thinking that. Get ready for the most room temperature hot take ever. I don't think Super Donkey Kong is a very good game. Yeah, I know that's a contrarian view so common that the only people who still seem to defend this as a good game are those who haven't played it in 25 years. Super Donkey Kong was of course one of the biggest hits of the 16-bit era, and it was just as big in Japan as it was everywhere else. It brought the arcade villain out of the early 80s, and made him the hero of his own platforming game, where he was attempting to get his bananas back from a gang of pirate crocodiles. Its big selling point were its visuals, the pre-rendered 3D graphics that made up everything. Super Donkey Kong is a game that was so concerned with how things look that they didn't really consider how they played as a result of that look. It makes the visual design a bit of a mess, 
actively making it harder to play. It takes time to know exactly where edges are, and they don't really correspond to the visuals. And all of that is really at its worst when you reach the infamous minecart levels. Now that isn't to say the game is all bad. The music in it is all absolute classics. And some of the later levels have pretty good concepts behind them. But the bosses are about as generic as you can get, and about three quarters of the stages are painfully generic. And the secrets aren't really any fun to collect, with no real reward at the end of those. Super Donkey Kong is a game that's never as good as you want it to be. I also don't think the game's especially difficult. The complete list of things that will actually push back against players are the minecart levels, a few of the stages in the last world, and the final boss. Maybe the hardest thing about the game is that you can only save at one spot in every world, so if you go straight onto the next stage after you beat a boss instead of backtracking, then you could be playing for a while before you can save. Even in terms of difficulty, I think the second and third games give you a better challenge. They're definitely the ones to play. The strangest thing for me about Breath of Fire 2 is that it takes place in the same world as the original Breath of Fire. Continuity between RPG sequels is weirdly uncommon, especially in the longer series. But as you're playing Breath of Fire 2, you'll come across a lot of things from Breath of Fire 1. Now personally, I find Breath of Fire 2 to be a relatively standard RPG. It's really not that difficult to get to the ending as long as you're willing to pound on it for a while. It's awfully grindy, you'll have to sit there and repeat the same battles over and over again, but it's not that difficult. Its addition to the list of 100 impossible games is because it's very easy to miss the best ending. There's a one-time missable event at one dungeon where if you do not have the correct character in your party, then you're locked out of it. Later remakes of the game add some signposting here to help make sure people don't miss it. The thing is though, fans of the series think that the neutral ending is the better ending. Or at least more thematically appropriate. So this is a game that's not especially difficult except for one particular part that doesn't really matter and the people who like the game think it's better to skip it anyways. I suspect that the real reason it's on the list is that Breath of Fire 2 is a Super Famicom RPG that's maintained quite a bit of popularity over the years. It's here more because it was remembered than because it was impossible. Daikaiju Monogatari is a game with a bit of an odd history behind it. The original game was published by Namco for the Famicom, and it was one of their big box games. A game that came in an oversized box with extras like a giant fold-out map and cards for tracking abilities. All of those big box games for Namco were developed by Birthday, and when they decided to continue the series six years later, Namco wasn't interested, so they took it to Hudson. Though the format of Daikaiju Monogatari follows a different one of Birthday's big box games, Juve Quest. In particular, it's complicated party handling system. You have characters who are permanently part of your group, a spot set aside in your party for a character you summon during the battle, and ones that are used by temporary characters who join for a short time and really don't develop. The character designs carry over from Kaiju Monogatari, but the world and story of Daikaiju Monogatari are completely separate. The plot of the game involves being a person summoned from another world and asked to defeat an evil overlord. Turns out that there's more going on, though, than what you see at first. In fact, the game is known for being rather dark and cruel for having such a bright and cheerful appearance. In fact, that seems to be the only reason it was included in the book. Though I don't think a cute RPG turning dark and scary is really something that makes it an impossible game. There are missable events that will lock you out of getting party members, and the game is often not especially well signposted. If you mash your way through some cutscene dialogue, you could easily find yourself having no clue what to do next. But that stuff is just par for the course for an RPG in the 90s. There's another reason why this game probably shouldn't be on this list, 
but I won't get to that for a little while still. Well, that's another 25 games down. We're 75 games into this 100 game list, which means it's time for another intermission. Go refresh your drink, use the restroom, just get out of that chair, you've been sitting there too long. And in the meantime, I'm going to quickly talk about a few Game Boy versions of titles that we've been seeing. Gambare Goemon, Sarawarata Ebisumaru, was the first Goemon game for the Game Boy, and it's a throwback to the Famicom style of Goemon games. You explore these levels in a style very similar to a belt-scrolling beat-em-up. Attacking people gets you money, which you use to buy equipment, which you use to survive until the end of the stage. There's also some small adventure and puzzle game elements to it, but for the most part, what you're seeing here is what you get. Monster Maker on the Game Boy is the first Monster Maker video game, period. And the Monster Maker that we saw before was Monster Maker 3 because of this game and then the Famicom RPG. This one is dramatically different from the Monster Maker 3 that we saw, which was more of a standard RPG. Instead, this one uses more of a board game format, with dungeons laid out as cards, and managing your character's resources is really the key to success. It actually makes it one of the trickier RPG-style games you're going to find. Or at least the strategies aren't as obvious as they are in some. It's definitely a quirky game, though. Metroid 2 The Return of Samus is the direct storyline prequel to Super Metroid. In fact, if you watch the intro, they kind of recreate the ending to Metroid 2, at least in cutscene form. It's considerably more linear than the games that surround it in the series. Though due to all the areas kind of looking the same on the Game Boy, it's still fairly easy to get lost. Even with the reduced action, it's still a good translation of the Metroid concept to the Game Boy. Red Reamer on the Game Boy is the first Red Reamer game. I honestly don't think it's especially difficult. Well, other than a few stages where suddenly things jump up a little bit. But it is a pretty good time. And if you play the series in order, going from this Game Boy game to the Famicom game to Demon's Blazin', you get an interesting evolutionary view as each step goes up to stronger hardware. I'll give Super Donkey Kong GB this. They made a strong effort to translate the game to the Game Boy. Unfortunately, it really does not work. The already not very clean visuals become extra muddy here, and this is with the Super Game Boy palette, so it's even worse on the original hardware. It controls worse, the levels are harder to figure out. It's just a worse playing experience all around. This is the same kind of not really functional spin-off of a better game that gave portable games such a bad reputation. And well, that's it for my look at Game Boy stuff. Come on back in, have a seat, and let's finish off this list of 100 impossible Super Famicom games. I'd like to think I'm at least tangentially responsible for some of the Umihara Kawase renaissance that's happened in recent years. Okay, not in Japan, but I did work on something that got the game more attention outside of Japan than it likely ever had before. So maybe I had some small part in getting these games released internationally. Umihara Kawase was also the first Super Famicom game I ever purchased. I paid a whopping 1,000 yen for it. Totally worth it. The concept behind Umihara Kawase, because there really isn't a story, is that you're a girl with an elastic fishing pole, and sea life has emerged from the oceans to try to kill you. Your goal is to clear the last stage, but there's a hard time limit on the game. The credits always roll after 30 minutes. The path to the final stage isn't always obvious, and using that elastic fishing pole to grapple yourself around the stages is really complicated. You can do a lot of tricks to fling yourself around with it, but it also takes a fair amount of skill to use it well. I'd say Umihara Kawase is one of those games where the skill ceiling is way high. If you master the game, you can pull off some really cool tricks, but it'll take you a while to master them. On the positive side of things for when you're starting out, they do give you a ton of lives and some tutorials. 
it's not that bad to sit down and try to work your way through some stages. It's just clearing the final stage is a hurdle that will challenge even the best players. And unfortunately, there isn't really a different ending after that. It's just a stage where after you complete it, you always get the credits to roll, instead of after the 30 minute mark. Lumihara Kawase is one of the real gems of the Super Famicom, and it's a strange game that's approachable, but still amazingly difficult. This must be the portion of the list dedicated to grappling hooks. Pack in Time has that as a core mechanic as well. I want you to take a look at this side-scrolling puzzle platform game based on Pac-Man, and make a guess where it was developed. Take a look at the palette, the way the game controls, how the goal on every stage is to collect all of the items and go to the exit, the way the stages are laid out as big empty areas with occasional splashes of items. This was originally an Amiga game, and that means it came from Europe, France in particular. It's a graphical revamp of the game that was called Fury of the Furries on the Amiga. The plot of Pack in Time is technically a direct sequel to Hello Pac-Man, or Pac-Man 2 The New Adventures if you're outside of Japan, a witch has sent Pac-Man back in time, as well as shrunk his legs and nose so that he now looks like a round ball, and now Pac-Man has to chomp his way through history to get back. Yes, the fact that the witch shrunk his arms and nose is part of the story. On every stage you have to eat all of the power pellets, and that's counting down on the screen for you. Then the exit opens up, and you advance to the next level. There's 51 stages in total, though the 51st stage is just fighting the boss. The key to the game are the rings that you pass through, and when you go through these, you gain a power-up. You might start a stage with some power-ups already, but generally the puzzles revolve around getting the correct item. You've got a fireball that can take out enemies, a hammer that can smash the floor, a bubble that will let you swim underwater, and of course, the grappling hook. A lot of the more difficult parts of the stages require that you fling yourself around using it. There are also power pellets that make you invincible and let you chomp the ghosts. Back in Time is a bit notorious for its difficulty, mainly due to not explaining the game mechanics very well. Many of the stages require that you use those abilities in non-obvious ways that are only used like that on that particular stage. Like at one point you use the grappling hook to move an object, or another where the hammer can suddenly reflect attacks. It's a bit of a clunky game, but it does have a following in Japan. Super Bomberman Panic Bomber W is part of a weird line of Bomberman-themed puzzle games that Hudson was making at the time. A simpler version of it was released a few months before this Super Famicom game on Japanese computers and the PC Engine CD. Yep, that is barely still around in 1995. And a few months after this release, Hudson will make another version of it for the Virtual Boy. Yep, we've just about reached the Virtual Boy in history. The concept of Panic Bomber is straightforward. It's a less engaging Puyo Puyo with some bombs. Instead of two jellies, you get three colored Bomberman heads that come down in a clump. And when you get three in a row of any color, they vanish, making anything above them drop down. If you can clear a large number of Bomberman heads, or chain a few clears together, then bombs will push up from the bottom of the screen. You're also filling up a gauge that will cause a giant bomb to drop that clears an area. The regular lit bombs just explode like regular Bomberman bombs, potentially causing a chain reaction. Though for some reason, you have to hit Bomberman heads twice with an explosion to make them vanish. Naturally, you're competing against someone on the other side, and as big explosions are caused, junk will appear that can block off their stack unless it's destroyed by a bomb. Story Mode has Bomberman traveling around the world, taking on national stereotypes, and the difficulty quickly ramps up to the point where you really have to master making long chains in order to stand any kind of chance. There's only six rounds of battles like this, though every round you have to defeat them three times, but the AI for your opponents are so good that you have to be an amazing player to even stand a chance. Unfortunately, Panic Bomber is a bit of a dull game, 
the techniques you can employ are rather limited, so there's not much incentive to get good enough in order to regularly beat the computer. Magical Poppin's a bit of an interesting title. It's a good game. In fact, I'd say it's a very good game. It also happens to be one of the top five most expensive Super Famicom games. If you want this one, you have to pay for it. The story behind the game is about as straightforward as they get. A bad guy steals the kingdom's treasures, so Princess Poppin goes after them. Poppin has two primary ways to deal with enemies. A sword swing, and that's what you'll be using most of the time, and magical attacks. Across her adventure, she collects additional magical abilities, and using any of these costs stars. Stars tend to be annoyingly rare, so you really don't want to use magical abilities unless you have to. Or unless you've really plotted out a route through the game that takes advantage of it. While there are only six stages, they are sprawling mazes. Tons of nooks and crannies everywhere hiding all sorts of additional bonuses and power-ups. It's almost Metroid-like, though much smaller in scale. You will have to locate the power-up for that stage in order to continue, after all. But there's a lot going on in Magical Poppin. The moment-to-moment -moment gameplay isn't that difficult. What makes it a challenge is that unless you've mastered the game, it takes about three hours to finish. There are no save games and there are no passwords. You have to sit down and play it through. It's that length of the game, and the fact that it's almost impossible to acquire, that make Magical Poppin an impossible game. Shin Sekok La Wares is one of the more infamous games on the Super Famicom. It's known for being an RPG that is completely incomprehensible. There are huge chunks of the story missing, and the game is riddled with typos, making it even harder to understand. Though it does have this giant level up text for some reason, which became a bit of a meme on the Japanese internet. The plot of the game is that it's a fantasy world where there are giant robots, and you're a young adventurer who wants to find a particular giant robot to use as a weapon. Don't ask me to explain it further than that, I actually can't. The reason for the confusion is that Shinsei Kok was not intended to stand alone. It was part of a whole multimedia franchise thing, with tie-in novels and comics and other things planned that were supposed to give you the whole picture. Not that it really helps anyone. The game is known for being aggressively mediocre. There's games with worse bugs, there's games with worse combat systems, there's games with worse dungeons, there's games with worse plotting. But it's rare for a game to be so consistently bad across all subjects. I was going to have a section here attempting to explain the combat system, which superficially looks like standard RPG combat, but it really isn't. The thing is, I've now read multiple explanations of it, and I still have no clue how it works. I don't even know if it's supposed to work the way that they're describing that it works. Because some of it is so outrageous it sounds like those are bugs rather than actual design. The highlights are that equipment doesn't seem to really do anything, you can't use items in combat, and character stats all seem to work off of the lead character rather than the own character's abilities. Other negative aspects to the game are how you can't really explore the world, instead you walk out the door and choose a destination, then watch your robot slowly walk over there. When you get a game over, it's possible to crash the game. You can also do that by walking on the wrong spots in dungeons. Enemies don't drop cash in regular combat, you have to get into mech combat to earn money. And the bosses are notable for being brick walls of difficulty. They will just smash you unless you are really overleveled. A lot of RPGs are more tests of patience than anything else, but Shin Sekoku is a game that will make you want to give up long before you finish. Snoopy Concert is a different kind of game. Right from the start, its development is weird. Pax Sofnica is typically credited as the developer, but it's known that Nintendo themselves worked on it as well. The publisher, Mitsui Fudo-san, is one of the largest real estate companies in Japan, and Snoopy Concert is their only game. The designer is the creator of F-Zero, 
the person who composed most of the music, composed for Super Metroid, and Gunpei Yokoi himself worked on it. It's not really clear why it has such a weird publisher rather than Nintendo releasing it themselves, but I suspect it's some kind of roundabout licensing deal with United Feature Syndicate. The concept of the game is that Snoopy's holding a concert and nobody's showing up because they're all tied up with other problems. So Snoopy has to play through six adventuring game scenarios in order to make his concert a success. In these scenarios, you're not controlling Snoopy directly, you're controlling Woodstock, and you can point out places of interest for Snoopy. The scenario you're seeing me play here is Charlie Brown's scenario. It's one of the more straightforward ones, as everyone has just lost something and you have to make sure they get it back. Despite the game being based on peanuts, it is notoriously difficult. Part of that has to do with how you don't have direct control over Snoopy, and sometimes it requires a little bit of finesse to interact with objects. And part of that is sometimes the puzzles are just really hard. It helps to use the Super Famicom mouse, but not everyone had access to that. On top of that, while the game does have passwords to let you continue playing, they tend to be not really as convenient as you'd like. In fact, one of the more difficult scenarios has to be done all at once. The passwords don't save any progress for it. Despite the challenge, Snoopy Concert is regarded as one of the best licensed character games on the Super Famicom. Snoopy Concert is one of the good ones. Der Langrisseur is a, another game with a bit of a weird pedigree. Despite the title, it is not the first game in the Langrisseur series. That would be the game released in the US as War Song. Instead, this is a heavily, and I do mean heavily, modified version of Long Reser 2. So much has changed that it's considered to be a bit of a spin-off of the series, not an actual port, though it has the same storyline. The concept is that centuries after the first game, an emperor gets an evil sword and revives the demon armies, and then a descendant of the hero from the first game gets involved because they destroy his home village while looking for a woman. The basic structure of the game is that you have individual scenarios where typically you have to defeat all of the enemies on the field. You have a set of commanders and you purchase troops for them. Each commander has a different set of units that they can lead and provide their own modifiers to those units. A type of commander also gives certain advantages, like a wizard will let his units have a ranged first strike. There are a lot of potential combinations here with everyone having about 10 different types of units that they can command. And while the units don't develop over time, the commanders do, getting experience through battle and eventually leveling up and improving their class. There's four different storyline routes you can follow through the game, and the one that is almost identical to the original Langley's Sir 2 is relatively easy. The other three are nearly impossible. In fact, the game is so notoriously difficult in that regard that most people get stuck on the second scenario. Berlinglisier is very popular among strategy game fans, but this version is a game with an extremely steep learning curve, and you practically need to follow a guide the first time that you're playing through it. Well, here's a big one. Yes, they spill it Yasi on the box. It's one of those things that's always bothered me. So for the sake of my sanity, I'm just going to call it Yoshi's Island. Technically inaccurate, but it'll save me from having to re-edit my audio several times. The long-awaited sequel to Super Mario World arrived, and it was spectacular. Potentially one of the greatest platforming games ever made. The plot is that Yoshi has found some baby Marios, and an evil wizard Koopa wants them. That sets off a journey across Yoshi's Island. Yoshi's picked up some new tricks. He can flutter in the air when he jumps, giving himself a small boost to distance. And enemies that he swallows can be turned into eggs that Yoshi can throw at distant targets. Now it's not especially difficult to clear all six worlds and run through eight stages for each of those in order to complete the game. 
It's not easy, it's just not something that will really stress anybody who's decent at games. What is wildly difficult, and I'd say makes it an impossible game, is trying to get perfect scores on all of the stages, thus unlocking the additional special stages. To do that, you have to get five flowers on every stage, get 20 red coins, they're hidden among the regular coins and have a slightly different color to them. And most cruelly, you have to complete the stage with 30 seconds on your baby Mario timer. Anytime you're hit, Mario flies off Yoshi's back and that timer starts ticking down. You start the stage with 10 seconds on the timer, you get 10 by passing through the ring at the halfway mark, and then you have to find stars to fill up the rest of it. And on many stages, it also means you cannot get hit at all. Trying to do that turns Yoshi's Island into a brutally difficult challenge. But if you don't want that, you can always just be satisfied with whatever score you get at the end of the stage. There have been horror games before Clock Tower, of course, but Clock Tower was in exactly the right place at exactly the right time to be a huge influence on the genre. The plot of the game is that Jennifer goes to a remote boarding school in the Swiss mountains where a killer is picking off her classmates one by one. But Jennifer has some abilities that will help her turn the tables. Oh, sorry, that wasn't Clock Tower. That was Phenomena, the movie that Clock Tower ripped off. They even used an image of Jennifer Connelly as the main character's portrait. The on-screen models actually rotoscoped from one of Human's employees, so at least they didn't take that from the film. Clock Tower is a point-and-click adventure game, and one of the key things about it is that occasionally you'll get attacked by the Scissor Man, a slasher who will chase you around and kill you unless you can find a good hiding place. You also have to find the appropriate place to point the cursor at, and that's sometimes easier said than done. This is another game with multiple endings, and getting the true ending, where everything gets resolved, is incredibly difficult. This is one of those point-and-click adventure games where you can make a mistake early on and it screws up the rest of your game. Clock Tower is also a bit buggy. Infamously, you can enter a room and then just suddenly keel over dead. Clock Tower was remade, and I think that's the version that most people prefer to play these days. But it's hard to argue that this isn't a significant and very difficult game. Hamelin no Violin Hiki is a longtime staple of those lists of hidden gems on the Super Famicom that never were released outside of Japan. It's based on a relatively popular comic, but you really don't need to know anything about that to play the game. The plot is about a troupe of musicians who have magical instruments that can be used to harm the demons throughout the land. And naturally, they're trying to stop a demon king. The key to this game is that you have a partner that can follow you around or stay in place depending on how you order them, and you can put them in a wide variety of costumes that you collect over the course of the game. These costumes change how the character behaves. So, to use an early example, you might be able to ride on their back to get over some rough terrain. That makes this into a bit of a puzzle platformer, where a careful use of that companion is required to reach the end of the stage. Unfortunately, controlling that companion is a real nightmare. They never seem to do quite what you want them to. Though if you do get frustrated with her, you can always pick her up and throw her. The game is remembered for being relatively difficult, with stages and bosses that will give you a tough time when you're first figuring them out. However, it's also a very, very long game. Four or five hours is not uncommon. And there's no way to save your progress or use a password to continue later on, so you have to be really dedicated to complete this one. Or I guess these days you could always use an emulator and save states. The plot also ends rather prematurely. It didn't even adapt half of the comics that were out at that point. So there's no resolution to the storyline, even if you're playing for five hours. Despite that, this is still a game that plays really well, and it's a lot of fun. Though that length definitely justifies it as an impossible game. Little peek behind the curtain here. Shockingly, I don't have enough time to play 100 games through, and so I'm just trying to get some interesting footage from early portions of the games. 
When available, I've been taking advantage of existing saves on the cards. I didn't have that for Light Fantasy 2, and so I fell into one of the initial traps that makes it such a difficult game. After a very introductory cutscene, your character starts out as a baby lost in the woods. You're supposed to take a few steps and trigger a cutscene, but you can have random encounters as you take those first few steps. And as you might expect, a baby versus some monsters doesn't go well for the baby. Even if you make it into the first town, you have to spend a long time recruiting a group to help you. Light Fantasy 2 just has a very, very slow start. We saw the first Light Fantasy about 70 games ago, and there really isn't that much difference between the two. The combat system is just as brutal as it ever was, but there are certain unbalanced game elements here that if you take advantage of them, then things get trivialized. Basically, play fair and lose, or cheese the hell out of the game and steamroll everything. The plot of the game is that the good goddess from the first game has turned evil, and as the hero, you have to perform a long, long series of FedEx quests, going out, getting items, and returning them to people, in order to defeat her. Yet one of the major complaints about the game is just how terrible the story is. Maybe the biggest problem with this game is that you can save anywhere. And that means it lets you save the game in unwinnable states. The save system seems to break other aspects of the game's scripting as well. Still, I get the impression that Light Fantasy 2 is a game that tries your patience more than tests your skill. And we definitely didn't need two Light Fantasy games on this list. Fushigi no Dungeon 2 Furai no Shiren is one of my favorite RPGs on the Super Famicom. I know it can be hard to tell just watching it, but this is a roguelike. And I don't mean roguelike in the modern sense, where they just randomize some stuff. I mean this is a roguelike in the Berlin interpretation. This is a game that took direct inspiration from games like Rogue and NetHack. Monsters move when you do, though if you spend too long thinking, they might move on their own. You have to manage your hunger that grows every time a step happens. And items along with their descriptions are randomized every time you start the game. And naturally, there's permadeath. You're going to die and get sent back to the beginning a lot. Now, the Fushigi no Dungeon series has streamlined a lot of those rough edges that Rogue has. There's only a handful of equipment slots. Your only real actions are to move, change what direction you're facing, attack or interact with someone, and use items from your inventory. And depending on the item, that could be to consume it, throw it, or drop it. There are a few persistent things here, as Sheeran wanders the world, he'll encounter a lot of different people, and fulfilling their request can result in some kind of benefit that carries over, often affecting one of the stable towns that you encounter on the quest. And one of the recommended ways to beat the game is to use a storehouse that can carry over goods between sessions and spend a lot of loops of the game powering up items kept there. Think of it as taking advantage of your bones files. This is a really good game that's simple and fast enough that you'll keep going back for one more try. And that's good, because it's going to take you a long time to beat this one. It takes both a lot of luck and a lot of skill to make it all the way to the end. If you haven't watched my channel before, then you wouldn't be aware that I hate Sugoroku-based games. What's Sugoroku? It's a genre of Japanese board game that is about the simplest board game you can imagine. Basically, players roll dice, move that many spaces, an event occurs, and eventually the game ends without the player having significant input to the result. There are games where the player doesn't even have to be there and the result is the same. In the case of Shonin yo Taishi o Irake, it's not as bad as a lot of sugoroku based games that I've encountered but I'm really glad I don't have to play this one all the way through. One thing that they do to help you is that you don't have to move the maximum number of spaces. If you pass a port, you can choose to stop there rather than moving on. So some of the luck is mitigated, though not all of it. 
The game has the players taking the roles of merchant traders, sailing around a map, buying goods and selling them. The goods that you buy spoil, so you have to sell them quickly at an appropriate port, in which case you have to roll well to reach that additional port. You can also steal from your opponents if you land on them, in which case you roll the dice and the end result is effectively random. And there are monsters that you can fight in a similar way, where you roll the dice and the outcome is random. The game has a story mode where you compete in multiple board games like this, and since there's very little that you can do to affect the outcome of the board game, you just have to hope that the dice come up in your favor. In modern board game design, mitigating luck is a common gameplay element. You might not roll well, but there's other advantages that you get for that to balance things out. And you might be able to take certain actions in order to maximize your odds. Well, that's not really the case here. You mainly have to get really lucky in order to beat this one. Sorry, Senshi fans. Doraemon 4, Nobita to Suki no Okok is not a crossover with Sailor Moon. It's not that Moon Kingdom. Instead, it's another Doraemon platformer. And it's actually the final Doraemon Super Famicom game. About two months after this, they released the first Doraemon game on the PlayStation, and then never looked back. The plot of the game is that a giant owl has stolen a moon-shaped brooch from Shizuka, so the entire Doraemon gang chase after it to get that brooch back. That might simultaneously be the most absurd and mundane plot for any of the games in this video. Before each stage, you choose one of six characters, and just like the first Doraemon game we saw, they have slightly different characteristics. One of the big features of the game is that a ton of Doraemon's inventions are floating around for players, though a lot of them seem to come down to shoot a bullet at someone. But there's a whole bunch of different shapes that bullet can take. There's also a power-up that brings in one of the other characters, randomly selected, to sit on your shoulders and take an additional shot. Which just looks really weird. The reason that Doraemon 4 is on this list of impossible games is that some of the later stages are among the most difficult platforming on the Super Famicom. Just completely cruel level design, like the stuff you find in the more crazed Super Mario Maker levels. You can mitigate some of that with your character selection, since everyone can open up different paths. And you can play cooperatively, though I'm not sure how that would help you with the platforming. Doraemon 4 is a surprisingly tough game once you're past these initial stages. The fourth and final Ganbare Goemon game for the Super Famicom takes Goemon to the place that all fourth entries in franchises have to go to. Space. The plot of the game is that Goemon's giant robot, Impact, has to return to his home world. An evil dictator is taking over all of the planets there, so Goemon and his buddies all take off with Impact to go stop him. The way that this game works is that everyone is scattered onto a different planet, and each planet has its own set of stages. So Goemon has his own world, Abisumaru has his own, and so on. As you explore the one place uncorrupted by capitalism, there are the usual town stages where you explore, acquire equipment, and chat with the locals, and side-scrolling stages, where you jump and chop people up. As you're poking around, you'll encounter plenty of places where you'll have to acquire a particular power-up before you're allowed to continue, like a grappling hook for Goemon. This is one of those games where it's not that difficult to move through things as long as you're willing to switch up worlds and walk back and forth for a while. The real challenge here comes from trying to get 100% of the game. There's a lot of not-intuitive puzzles, where you'll have to clear one character's world, which will let you use them in other worlds, and then you'll be able to collect the items there. I'll also say that if you wanted to play 16-bit Golmon, this wouldn't be where I'd start. This is the game where they were trying out new gameplay concepts for the upcoming Nintendo 64 games, and there's still some things that were clunky. So maybe not the best choice as a Golmon game for the list, or as an impossible game. 
Talking Mickey Memorial wasn't the first dating sim, but it was the first one that counted. Originally, it was a PC Engine CD-ROM game, but it became a smash hit on the PlayStation. And then only after that did it come to the Super Famicom. The concept behind Tokimeki Memorial is that you're a new high school student, and you'll be simulating out your three years in school. Your goal is to find true love by the end of that, and you do that by meeting one of several different women, getting the appropriate stance up high enough that they'll want to spend time with you, and then building up your affection with them by going on dates. And the way that most of this works is that you pick out an activity every day that you'll take part in. And that activity will change your stats, driving some of them up and sending others down. There's a little bit of randomization in that, too. You might fail to do well at an event and not get any gains at all. Still, it's not hard to work out which events affect what. And the women in this game are written as such broad stereotypes that you'll easily know exactly what they want out of you. Even the, quote, best ending, unquote, where you get together with the most generic woman in the game, is easy to figure out the requirements for and follow it through to the end. She just wants pretty good stats everywhere. I'm actually a little bit puzzled why this one would be on a list of impossible games. Tokimeki Memorial was extremely popular, but it's not even remotely difficult to get any ending that you want. It's not even a good example of a Super Famicom game, since the version that people really remember and go back to is the PlayStation. This one being here just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. And speaking of weird inclusions, here's Tsukiko Mori, the only visual novel on the list. If you're looking at the box and wondering why the title's just Tsukiko Mori, it's because that's the reading of the kanji at the top, and since it's an unusual reading, they also spelled out the title. The kanji is a reference to darkness, and the meaning of the title itself, taken literally, is the last day of the month. But in this case, I think it's just supposed to invoke some sense of spooky ending. This is the second game in a horror series, and the concept behind it is that at a remote farmhouse, Six people have gathered after someone died, and to pass the time in the evening, they take turns telling each other scary stories. You can experience the stories for any of the first six characters in any order, and then the sixth story that you choose will lead into the final story. As a horror game, it's relatively easy to get a bad ending. A majority of the choices you'll face will be continue the story or die. That means you'll wind up having to replay large chunks of the game but that doesn't really make it difficult, just time-consuming. The individual scenarios tend to be relatively short. If you're not rushing through it like I am in this video, it might take you about half an hour to read all of it. At least some of the stories kind of capture the spooky vibe of Japanese horror of the late 90s. Lots of people contorted into odd shapes coming at you. This isn't an especially popular visual novel, and I think most of that comes down to so many of the choices just being pick correctly or die. Again, this is just a strange choice for this list. If they just wanted a visual novel that was willing to kill the protagonist and give you a little bit of a hard time, there's plenty of other better options on the Super Famicom. When Kirby shows up on a Nintendo platform, you know things are coming to an end. Okay, not so much in the past 10 years, but before that, Nintendo would really only let Kirby loose on one of their consoles when it was on death's door. At least in the case of Hoshino Kirby Super Deluxe, the Super Famicom got a game that's often pointed to as the best in the Kirby series. This isn't a singular game. It's many Kirby games on one cartridge, with different mechanics driving each of those games. Now, none of these modes are super difficult to defeat, except maybe the arena mode, which has you fight every single boss in the game. However, right, this is a game where it's very difficult to get everything. In particular, during the cave minigame, your goal is to collect all of the treasures, but many of the treasures require that you have mastered some of the more complex movement techniques that some of Kirby's copy abilities grant. That means you need to find the treasure, figure out how you need to get it, 
locate an appropriate enemy or power-up, and then pull off the technique you need to collect it. There's also the issue that this mode takes a long time to complete, and it can be very difficult to backtrack if you've missed something. Other modes available in Hoshino Kirby Super Deluxe include a remake of the original Game Boy game, a rather straightforward game mode where you just clear levels, a short mini-game called Gourmet Race where you're racing Kirby's arch foe to eat as much food as possible, a game mode where Kirby has a time limit to clear stages and defeat Meta Knight, and finally one where you can clear stages in any order but you can't copy abilities until you find something that will just let you select any ability that you want. The great strength of Hoshino Kirby Super Deluxe is the way that Kirby's copy ability now works. For the most part, you still swallow enemies and then can copy what they do, but a copied ability is no longer one action tied to a button. Many of these grant Kirby several abilities, not just one, and a lot of them change how Kirby moves. It makes this game have an incredibly dynamic range of actions that you can take. More than just about any 16-bit game, except possibly one. And I'm going to talk about that one in a couple of games. Hoshino Kirby Super Deluxe is a masterpiece. One of the greatest games on the Super Famicom. Even if it isn't especially difficult to beat. You might be asking yourself, do I need to play Mahojin Guru Guru 1 before I play Guru Guru 2? And no, you don't need to. The first game was a roguelike, very similar to NX's Fushigi no Dungeon series, or Mystery Dungeon if you prefer. While this one turns it into an action RPG, kind of. It's a weird one. The game is based on a popular comic series, and the Guru Guru of the title refers to the magic circles that the heroine draws in order to fight monsters. The way the game works is that you're guiding a group that consists of a witch and a swordsman. You're controlling the witch and the swordsman follows behind. When you bump into a monster, the swordsman rushes up and locks one of the monsters in place. Then you can use the various magic spells from the witch to attack. The witch's attacks are extremely slow. It takes her time to draw the circle and then the attack to show up. And those attacks often go awry, catching yourself or your fighter friend in the damage. On top of that, the swordsman can only lock down one enemy at a time. So when you're fighting more than one, they'll be chasing your witch around the battlefield. And she is not especially maneuverable. There's a lot of attacks that are just unavoidable. Perhaps the worst moment in the game is the third boss, where I strongly suspect that there's a bug or a typo. That boss has 16 times the health of the previous boss, and you are definitely not 16 times as powerful when you get there. You basically have to pound on it for 5 to 10 minutes before it finally goes down. That said, the rest of the game is pretty solid. It has an action RPG where your character is very slow, and you have to plan your moves carefully, it's pretty distinctive. I just wish that boss wasn't so broken. You will not find any copies of Daikaiju Monogatari 2 with working batteries. Well, unless somebody's replaced the battery. If you buy a copy of this game, you're going to have to change it out. And you're going to have to change it out every few years. And that's because the cartridge for Daikaiju Monogatari 2 contains a clock. It keeps track of the date and time as you play. And there are in-game events that get triggered by certain times, like birthday presents that come out for various characters. While that is a significant addition to the game, the rest of the gameplay is essentially the previous Daikaiju Monogatari game that we saw. I have to really stretch to find some differences between the two, which makes the inclusion of Daikaiju Monogatari 2 on the list really odd. According to the book, it's on here because of the high encounter rate, but that's almost every RPG of the era. The only thing I could find Japanese players talking about that they found difficult in the game was that magic did way too much damage and thus certain enemies could just about kill you in one shot. But that's more of an annoyance than a genuine challenge. And once you've grinded your way past those enemies, the rest of the game is apparently trivial. 
This is an RPG that just tries your patience rather than your abilities. Nintaro Rantaro Special is the fourth of five Nintaro Rantama games released on the Super Famicom. And the first one of those was released in 1995, so they were cranking them out fast. While most of the games were based on the television series, this one is based on Nintama Rantaro the movie. Though, honestly, I'm not really sure it's worth watching either of those. Nintama Rantaro is about a bunch of kid ninjas in training, a weirdly popular genre for children's cartoons in Japan. The plot of the movie, and the game, is that the bad ninja group has stolen some stuff to make a medicine that will turn them into super ninjas. And then comedic hijinks ensue. The game is divided into action and adventure portions. The adventure portions just require that you click on different spots on the screen until eventually you're allowed to continue. The action portion is usually platformer stages, and these are really, really bad. The controls are floaty, the enemies are boring, the stage design is so bland that it could be served at a church potluck. You have a sword for close-up and shurikens for long-range attacks, and you can swap between two characters. Rontaro's the one with glasses, and he has a grappling hook that he can break out at some points while Kirimaru can climb some surfaces with his claws. Montaro also has claws, but can only use them to climb up from the very edge of things. Kirimaru also jumps very, very slightly higher than Rontaro, and at some points in the game you have to take advantage of that fact. The game is fairly difficult, but it mainly comes down to the controls and level design being awful, not because it provides an interesting challenge. And that's just the platforming stages. Some of the mini-games that you're required to complete are just completely broken thanks to being mostly random. There's one more thing that might make it impossible to beat, and that's how Nintamo Rantaro Special doesn't work on some versions of the Super Famicom. So it's entirely possible it just wouldn't play on your system. Lucky bastard. The best thing about this game is that it's really short, so you don't have to play it very long. It's easy for me to sit here and criticize and say, if I was making this list of 100 impossible games to beat on the Super Famicom, because that's the point of this video, but if I was making this list of 100 impossible games you want to beat on the Super Famicom, I probably would have gone with Super Donkey Kong 2 instead of 3. Not that I hate 3. Three's a really good game. I think the key to what makes Super Donkey Kong 3 great is the level design. Most of the stages here follow the ideal stage layout. Introduce a new concept or theme, and then iterate it until you've explored all of the options with it. So for example on this stage, I'm climbing a burning rope and dodging left and right to avoid things, and very occasionally departing the rope so that I could collect additional bonus items. And for the most part, the bonus stages here make sense and don't require that you haul barrels around forever checking every surface like they did in the original Super Donkey Kong. And Super Donkey Kong 3 is relatively difficult. By the mid-game, it's a real challenge to beat some of the stages. At least they're generous with extra lives, though you're probably not going to be wrecking up 20 or 30 of them like you easily could in the first game. One thing that a lot of people find challenging in the game is that Dinky Kong, the infant Kong there, moves more slowly and stiffly than Dixie Kong. It gives the pair a performance closer to the original Donkey and Diddy pairing from Super Donkey Kong, rather than Diddy and Dixie in Super Donkey Kong 2, where they both moved pretty quickly. Super Donkey Kong 3 is a pretty good game, and it's a decent challenge, especially if you want to go for 100% completion. Mini Yonku Shining Scorpion is a game that requires a little bit of explanation. The Yonku of the title refers to four-wheel drive slot cars, the kind where you'd build your own little model and then drop it onto a race course with a bunch of other kids and watch it go. The hobby's been through multiple cycles of popularity in Japan, and of course in 1996 it was once more hot. 
Mini Yonk Shining Scorpion is based on a comic, which is based on a brand of these toys. And the basic concept is what you'd expect. You go to a shop, you buy parts, you tune up your car, then you race, get money for doing well, which you use to buy more parts, make your car faster, and repeat. In the game, you travel from town to town, taking on stronger and stronger competitors. There's not much more to it than that. Generally speaking, you have to be really into tuning model cars if you're going to enjoy this game, because there's nothing else here for you. There is, however, one aspect to the game that makes it impossible. Your car parts wear down over time, and of course that reduces your car's performance. So it is very possible, and in fact kind of likely for a new player, to get into a death spiral, where because you've lost, you keep losing and you can't get replacement parts because you keep losing, which makes your car perform worse. And so you keep losing. This game made a lot of kids miserable that way. And once you're on that death spiral, the only way out is to restart the game all the way back at the beginning. Mini Yonk Shiny Scorpion is just a cruel game, much like the real world of miniature slot car racing. Didn't I just talk about a Kirby game? I mean, I don't mind talking about Hoshino Kirby 3 because it's an amazing game that, that people don't talk about nearly enough. It's fantastic. It's delightful. Its graphics are the ultimate expression of the 16-bit style, taking the concepts from Yoshi's Island one step further. And it's also not as good as Super Deluxe. Hoshino Kirby 3 is one extremely good game. Hoshino Kirby Super Deluxe is six amazing games. And then there's the question of, should this be considered an impossible game? Let me refer to the Hoshino Kirby 3 website from back in 1998. It essentially said, Games are too difficult these days. I wanted to play one that was more relaxing. That's why Kirby came back. So you know that this was going to be an easy one. The thing about that website, though, is... They lied. It's actually kind of infamous in Japan, and likely a major reason that Hoshino Kirby 3 is on the list. Nintendo and HALP said they were making an easy game, and it turned out to be just about the hardest Kirby game. The mini games in particular that sometimes crop up in the middle of stages and require that you beat them in order to continue are infamously hard. Some of them are so brutally difficult, they're essentially guessing games. Except you can't ever guess wrong. And even some of the regular stages later on can be pretty mean. Kirby as a series has a reputation for being very, very easy. Nintendo was probably leaning into that reputation with their advertising. So it's surprising how tough Hoshino Kirby 3 can get. It is a bit stop and go. You'll have a chill stage and then suddenly things will turn mean. It's still an exceptionally good game, though. And here we are, game number 100 on the list, Sute Hakun. In the very last days of the Super Famicom, Nintendo was publishing a few games that were originally Satella View games onto cartridges, and Sute Hakun comes from that. It was a short mini-game on the satellite platform that Nintendo had, and it proved to be so popular that they kept making puzzles for it. And this cartridge contains all of the puzzles that they created, plus about 20 more. A total of 120 in the end. It's the second to last Super Famicom cartridge officially released, though there were a few more released on the Nintendo Power platform of rewritable cartridges. The only cartridge release that followed it was a special edition package, so I guess that makes Sute Hakun the last proper Super Famicom release. As a puzzle game, the concept is that you're a Hakun, an odd figure that kind of resembles one of the drinking bird toys. You have the ability to suck up some things and then spit them back out again. You can suck up clear blocks to move them around, and you can suck up liquid and inject it into those clear blocks. Bricks that are filled in like this will move, and the color of liquid that you inject changes how it moves. You'll have to be careful with the positioning of the bricks, 
and make sure you inject the liquids at the right moment so that you can avoid stage hazards. On these early stages that you're watching me play, success is mainly about learning how to use your items. Later on, there's a lot more timing and platforming challenges involved. This was the first game by Indie Zero, the company that would go on to create the first two Game Center CX titles for the Nintendo DS, and then use those same techniques on old video games with the Famicom Remix series, or NES Remix, depending on your region. This one's a really good puzzler that gets pretty difficult by the end. And that's all of the games in the book Shinu Mai Ni Clear Shitai Ni Hyok no Murige. A bit of a weird resource from Japan. I got the book thinking it would highlight some interesting games for me, and maybe it did that. And I wanted it to give me some insight on what Japanese players thought of as the hard games for these systems. And I'm not really sure it did that. The editing here was just too slapdash for it to work as that kind of reference. But hey, at least we got to look at and talk about 100 interesting Super Famicom games, right? Here at the end, the obvious question is, what games would I put in such a book? Okay, if it were up to me, I'd rewrite the entire list. But without doing that, here's a few that I think would make decent inclusions. I actually think the book covered most of the games that I would single out as extra difficult RPGs on the console. Basically, Elnard and anything from the Shin Megami Tensei series. But there was one popular RPG-ish series that's very difficult that was overlooked, and that's Fire Emblem. And Fire Emblem Thracia 776 is often pointed to as the most difficult Fire Emblem game. And when you consider how difficult that series is, that is saying something. It's also the very, very last Super Famicom cartridge. The Metal Slater Glory release that followed it was actually a Nintendo Power cartridge already pre-programmed for it. Between being the last and only being available as a special edition from one store, if you want a copy, this one's pretty pricey. I felt like there weren't a lot of arcade-ish games on the list. The fighting games are probably the closest to that. I'm referring to games with simple gameplay elements that get iterated on rapidly, and because they're designed to extract 100 yen coins from pockets, they have a bad tendency to turn pretty cruel. I think Arkanoid Do It Again isn't as tough as some of the other Arkanoid games that are out there, but it is a game that requires a great deal of skill to complete. And it's a pretty good Arkanoid sequel. You can even play it with the mouse for analog controls, though I didn't have a surface handy for the mouse, so I'm just playing with the controller. It's a good game, and it's a decent challenge. The Super Nazo Puyo series are some of my favorite overlooked games on the Super Famicom. They're the puzzle game spin-off of Puyo Puyo. And I know what you're thinking, Puyo Puyo is already a puzzle game. How could they have a puzzle game spin-off? Well, instead of starting from a blank field, the well starts already filled in, and you have to clear out all of the Puyos with a number of preset drops. It requires precision and thought, especially as you get deeper into the game. It also plays out as a quest for some reason, but that's a lot less important than the puzzles. I found the puzzles in the sequel to be considerably more difficult than the original, so that's why I picked that one. But if you were just picking it up, I'd actually start with the first. Magic Sword is another game that came from arcades, and it was definitely designed to drain your money away. You have to climb up 50 stories of a tower to defeat an evil wizard. Capcom's home port doesn't even let you have unlimited continues. What they do give you is the ability to pick what floor you start at. But even if you jump all the way ahead to floor 33, you're gonna have a rough time. You have to be amazing if you're gonna make it all the way from the beginning to floor 50. On top of that, the power-up system in Magic Sword is relatively confusing. But once you have a handle on it, there's a huge array of possibilities between items you can carry, companions to bring along with you, and power-ups for those companions. It gives the game a lot more depth than you might expect. The special thing about Juso Kihei Vulcan is that it does a really great job of replicating the feel of the giant robot media of the day. 
You're driving a lumbering war machine. Okay, you have a high-speed dash, but for the most part, you're plodding along, blasting away anything that's in front of you. It has a story that pontificates, not especially deeply, on the nature of war and being a soldier. And while the game is relatively easy to start out with, but the difficulty ramps up extremely fast here, and there's limited continues. The game isn't really that long, but you've really got to get good if you're going to see the infamous ending. I'm going to wrap things up here with just a couple thoughts about impossible games. Ironically, it's really easy to make a game that's really hard. Here's a game for you. Take a coin. Flip it. Keep flipping until the same side comes up seven times in a row. Statistically, you're going to be at it for a few hours. But it will eventually happen. That's a difficult game, but it's not a fun one. It's an extreme example, but it applies everywhere. You can make jumps that require absolute precision, enemies that always perfectly target you, or give bosses way too much health. Making a game interestingly difficult is a real challenge. Getting that balance just right so that players not only feel like they can overcome something, but that they want to overcome it. So that the game pushes back just hard enough on players that it gives them a sense of accomplishment when they do well. I don't think every game on this list succeeded in this delicate balance. A lot of them were just mean. A lot of them weren't actually that difficult. Which isn't a bad thing, unless you're compiling a list of difficult games. But I think there's a lot here that could give you an interesting challenge if you're willing to take them on.